I'm a park ranger out in Nevada. There is an old abandoned mining town that set a ways off the main road. The park service had claimed it a while back, but people were not encouraged to visit there. In fact, it was plainly marked with signs that said, Off limits, no trespassing, danger. Heck, about the only thing they didn't do was build a moat around the place. Sometimes I wonder if they should. Some people need to learn to read or listen, one of the two, because it seemed like I was always chasing people out of there. They would look at me like I was crazy, but every one of them would spray gravel as they hauled it after I would tell them the story. I'm not supposed to tell the story. I've been warned many times, even threatened with much worse than the unemployment line. I guess it may be I need to learn to listen too because it was the best way to make sure people left and never came back. I'm tired of being told to keep my mouth shut. I'm tired that nothing's been done about it. We rangers are supposed to just go about our jobs and pretend that it never happened. Well, I believe that's the best and quickest way for it to happen again, and I never want it to happen again. It was a while ago. That's my way of saying that I forgot how long ago it was, but the memory is still fresh enough to tell. It was back when even I was unsure why the town was off limits. I had heard old wives' tales and urban legends, but no one would ever commit to anything concrete. I asked around once and was told that I was better off not knowing. The old rangers would just tell me to mind my business and to stay out of town but something about it always intrigued me. I was never good at blindly following orders, so as often as I could, I would find some excuse to drive past it. On that day, it was a good thing I did, or a bad thing depending on how you look at it. I noticed a small mobile home parked at the edge of town. I knew that it hadn't been there the day before. I pulled up behind it and got out of my truck. I scanned the area around and didn't see anything moving that the wind wasn't blowing. I walked around the vehicle and it seemed to be in good shape. None of the tires were flat. There seemed to be no good reason for them sitting there unless they were sightseeing. I picked in the windshield but I couldn't see anyone so I went to the side door and knocked. Uh, park ranger, I said. Anybody in there? The wind whistling was my only answer. I knocked again. Park Ranger, is everyone all right? No answer. I pulled on the door latch and it opened. Coming in, I said. Just need to check to make sure that everyone's okay. I pulled the door open and I stepped inside. Unconsciously, I rested my hand on my sidearm. I closed the door behind me, leaving the wind outside. I looked around the camper and found plenty of food and supplies. They seemed to be well stocked up for the trip. I stepped back toward the bedroom, keeping an ear open for anything. It was eerily silent. The only thing that I could hear was the sound of my boots on the linoleum as I headed back the short hallway. It wasn't a long walk until I got there. The bedroom was clean and the bed had been made. I opened a few drawers and found clothes for a man and a woman. There was no sign of a struggle, so I went back out to the kitchen, stopped to open the bathroom door and found two kids' toothbrushes and toothpaste sitting on the sink. Just like the bedroom, everything seemed to be in its place. I noticed that the hand towel holder was empty. I looked on the floor to see if it had fallen, but the towel was just gone. I shrugged it off and I went back out to the kitchen. The table was still folded down into a bed as these smaller models were known for her. Scanning around, I was hard-pressed to find anything out of the ordinary, except for the fact that no one was there. I stepped outside and the sun had disappeared. It would be dark soon. I looked around, but I didn't see anyone. It was as if they had parked the camper at the edge of town and went for a walk. I stepped out of the camper and I turned to close the door. And that was when I saw it. A small red dot on the step. I leaned closer and it looked like it could be dried blood. 
I tried to dismiss it as nothing. People drip blood every day for simple, non-threatening reasons. Nosebleeds, small cuts, and general accidents. It could be absolutely nothing. But when you add in a missing family at the edge of an abandoned town that's supposed to be off limits, normal things don't look so normal. I didn't touch it in case it needed to be tested later for a DNA sample. And there it was. I was already starting to look at this as a crime scene. I looked down at the ground and I saw my boot prints in the dirt leading up to the camper. I also saw other tracks. There was another set of adult boot prints, a set of adult sneakers, and two different sets of smaller sneakers. Those were spooky but comforting. At least I knew these people were here somewhere. They hadn't just vanished from inside of the camper. No, it was the other footprints that gave me chills. They were adult-sized and it looked like there was more than one of them. But the creepy thing about them was that they were bare feet. I couldn't imagine anybody who lived in the area being stupid enough to walk around the desert in their bare feet. Aside from the different types of scorpions, you also had to worry about snakes, spiders, and lizards, just to name a few. It was becoming more likely that I would find this family dead from stupidity. I followed the barefoot tracks and they seemed to lead around the corner of the camper. In fact, they did several laps around the camper, with frequent stops where the feet were pointed toward the camper as if looking inside. That's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. This family had been stalked. I stepped in a wider circle so I wouldn't disturb the footprints. It became more apparent by the minute that this was a crime scene. I pulled on my radio to call on my position and request backup or police, but my radio was strangely silent. It didn't even click when I had released the talk button. The light was lit so I knew the battery was charged, it just wasn't transmitting. The smart thing to do just then would have been to get in my truck and drive to the station to report what was happening. I took one step toward the truck, and that's when I heard the scream. It was a woman's scream, high and piercing. A scream of pain and anguish, as if her whole world had come crashing down. My fight or flight kicked in and there wasn't an ounce of flight in it. In a heartbeat, my gun was in my hand. I turned toward the town and began following the footprints. Once they were done circling the camper, they headed straight into town. Dusk had faded and taken the light with it. I pulled my flashlight off my belt and used it to guide me on my trail. There were a half dozen buildings, all in some level of decay. I was worried about stepping into one and just collapsing on top of me. That aside from the chance of meeting a scorpion or some other creature that didn't appreciate being disturbed in their territory. The wind had died down and the air was still. It was so quiet that I could hear my own footsteps. And there was something else too. I felt a vibration in the air. At the time, I thought it was just my heightened senses at the prospect of meeting up with a dangerous person who may have harmed that family. Even though everything within me was demanding that I run towards the scream that I had heard, my steps were slow and measured. I needed more input. I needed to know how many people that I was dealing with. I needed to identify threats and I would be able to deal with this without becoming a victim myself. As I approached the first building, I had a strong feeling of being watched. Stepping on the porch made the boards creak threateningly. I didn't want this to end with a broken ankle or worse. I tested the boards before putting full weight on them and slowly approached the broken windows. I shone my light inside. I panned around slowly, finding a bunch of old boxes and general junk with the odd wooden chair and table. I was about to move on when back in the far corner, I saw a pair of eyes lit up by my flashlight. I froze. My light locked on it. The eyes seemed to be locked on the light as well. I couldn't tell what it was, but it scared the heck out of me. I suddenly thought of the movie that I had recently seen, Jurassic Park. When the actor was explaining how raptors attack, 
how one will draw your attention, while two more sneak up on you and attack from the side. I suddenly felt very vulnerable, as if someone was sneaking up behind me. I whipped around, pointing with my gun and flashlight, my eyes darting all around, but I couldn't see anything. I shone my light back inside, but the eyes were gone. This didn't comfort me, in fact, it did the opposite. I was in a panic. I felt like I was surrounded and they were toying with me. I didn't even know who they were. I took a few deep breaths to get myself under control. I knew that panic led to bad decisions and I couldn't afford any bad decisions out here on my own. I shone my light back toward the camper and saw a shadow dart out of the light. I knew that it was all or nothing. There was no backing out. I was being hunted and just like that family had been. I didn't know what was hunting me, but it didn't matter. Whoever or whatever, it was dangerous. Focus, I told myself. Stay on your toes, remember your training. Even though my training also said, don't get yourself in a bad situation, it was already too late for that. Something was near the camper. I still had no idea if this family was dead or alive. The only things that I had to go on were mysterious footprints and a scream. It was the stuff of every horror movie ever made. I just hoped that I didn't end up as one of the victims that died a horrible death to save some stupid teenagers who had risked their own lives by blundering into something that they should have left alone. I sighed, it turns my light back to the ground and I followed the footprints. I noticed for the first time that there were other marks among them. They had been walked over and obscured, but it looked like two long lines like somebody was being dragged. I brought my flashlight back up just in time to see a set of eyes disappear behind a building on the other side of the street. I stepped up to the next building and shone my light inside to find much the same as the first, minus the eyes. I didn't linger long before turning my light back out to the streets and to the other buildings. I felt like it somehow kept them at bay, as if they would work their way closer to me if I didn't sign the light their way. I didn't know how long this would last. I continued to the next building with a larger building looming larger at the end of the street. It looked like it was an old church. There was the rough shape of a steeple that had partially collapsed. I turned and flashed my light back to the street to keep the hunters back. When I stepped up to the window of the next building and showed my light inside, I found bones. Piles of bones. Most looked like they were from smaller animals, but there were larger ones interspersed with them. I was sure that I had spotted a couple of human femurs. I tried my radio again, but it still wasn't working. The vibration in the air was getting stronger. It was oppressive, like the pressure you feel when you're underwater. The stillness in the air had magnified any sound. I could hear the footsteps of somebody behind me. But when I turned, I couldn't see anyone. I left the bone storage building and headed for the last building at the end of the street, the church. I walked up to the doors and they were very plain. Two wooden doors and no gothic architecture, no cross. Just a couple of wooden doors that looked like they were about to fall off their hinges. I hesitated, turned and looked back down the street. I knew they were there, but I couldn't see them. This was where they had been hurting me all along. I held my gun and flashlight at the ready, knowing that I was in for a fight as soon as the doors had opened. I took a deep and cleansing breath, and then I shoved the doors open. I shone my light all around, my eyes darting into all the dark corners, except they weren't dark. There were candles lit all around, and it was quite beautiful. It was also quite empty. There was no one there. Even empty and well lit, it gave off a creepy vibe. I mean, why do empty churches always do that? You would think that it would be the opposite. My senses went on high alert. I didn't trust it. It had to be a trap. 
as I continued to scan back and forth looking for any hiding spots among the pews. I noticed that there was one person there, and the first pew bent over so I could barely see them. I slowly made my way forward, head on a swivel as I approached the lone figure. When I was nearly there, it looked like they were barely breathing. I came around in front of the creature and I aimed my gun. She looked up at me. She was naked and her hands and mouth were bound. As soon as she saw me, she started screaming into the gag in her mouth. She was screaming so hard that her face had turned red. I reached down and slid the gag out of her mouth. It's a trap, she screamed. I looked up and saw my worst nightmare. There were creatures, dozens of them. Each one looked vaguely human, but they were deformed. There was one that had one healthy arm and a second that was shriveled up. One had only a single leg but still managed to hop toward me. Another had no legs but used its arms to crawl on the floor. None of them had a full set of teeth, but they all had a look of hunger and rage in their eyes. And they came from everywhere. Some even crawled their way down from hiding places in the ceiling, like some horrific Spider-Man. They swarmed toward the front of the church. I looked around for anywhere to go, anywhere to hide, when I locked eyes in a door that looked like it was a closet. Come on, I said, grabbing her arm and dragging her over to the door. No, I can't, please don't make me, she said, tugging against me. We go in here or we die, I said, cutting the ropes around her wrists and putting my jacket over her shoulders. She reluctantly came along with me as the horde of creatures were nearly on us. Quick, I said, opening the door and shoving her through. I slammed it shut behind me, taking out my knife and jamming it into the wooden door frame to keep it shut. I turned and nearly ran her over. She hadn't moved. She was standing there staring into the dark. I shone my flashlight in front of us and saw a rickety staircase descending into the darkness. Please don't make me go down there, she whimpered. We don't have a choice, I said. They'll be through this door soon. The pounding had gotten louder. She turned toward the door and then pulled my jacket closer around her and took a deep breath. I stepped around her and led the way, shining my flashlight all around, trying to make sure that we wouldn't run into any surprises. The boards creaked menacingly with every step that I took. I couldn't see what was underneath, but I had no desire to find out the fast way. I looked back and she was still staring down. I held my hand out and she slowly took one step and then another. Her bare feet were filthy. I wondered if she was getting splinters as she took each step slowly and gingerly, as if walking on hot coals. After she had taken a few steps, I turned back to guide her way. The stairway was long and attached to an uneven stone wall. At some points it jutted out far enough that I had to squeeze around to get to the next step. It was getting colder as we descended. I started missing my jacket but knew that she needed it more. The spider webs weren't helping my anxiety either. I wondered if they were made by the deadly breed. I glanced back and saw that she was still working her way down the stairs. When I looked forward again, there was a creature coming up the stairs toward me. I didn't think, I just reacted. I barely had the gun even pointed until I fired. The creature fell back with shock frozen on its face and tumbled down the stairs. I instantly regretted my action, as my ears were already ringing from the gunshots in such an enclosed place. I turned around to check on her, but she was curled up in the fetal position sitting on a stop, ears covered and rocking back and forth. Hey, it's okay, I tried to say, but my voice sounded strange. I guess temporary deafness will do that. At least I hoped it was temporary. She didn't look at me. I wasn't sure if she had heard me, so I touched her shoulder and she immediately recoiled and climbed several stairs backing away. I bent down to her. 
Look, I know you're scared. I mean, I would be too. But if we're going to get out of this, we have to do it together. If I'm going to have to check on you every few steps, we'll be helpless if another one of those things attacks. I don't want to go down there, she stammered. I looked ahead and then back at her. We have no choice. I turned and started down the stairs again. After around a dozen steps, I turned to see that she had stood and was slowly making her way down again. I kept going until I made it to the bottom and kicked the body of the creature out of the way. I looked around, but there wasn't much to see. It was a passageway made of these same rough-cut rock walls and a dirt floor. I turned to see her make it to the last step. Her eyes were wide with fear. I could only imagine what she had already been through. She looked away as she stepped past the body. I decided to make a little conversation as we walked down the endless passageway to get her to focus on something other than our situation. You're from the camper, aren't you? I said. She nodded absently as she stared at the floor. Were you going on vacation? Another nod. I saw the kids' toothbrushes in the bathroom sink. How many kids do you have? Her eyes glazed over. Two. Uh, boys. And your husband is with you. She nodded. Where were you headed? Vegas. What made you stop here? The kids wanted to see the abandoned town. Tears streamed down her dirty cheeks, making lines on her face. Would you like me to stop talking? She nodded. We continued forward in silence. The chill of the place made me shiver, but not just because of the temperature. The thought of being attacked at any moment was more than keeping me on my toes. It was wearing on my nerves. After some distance, we came to an opening that stretched out into a full room. She stopped and stared. I was puzzled at first until I noticed the smell. It was the stench of death. I showed my light around the room. The first corner that I came to held a pile of bones. There was no denying that these ones were human. They were large and the right shape. They were even a couple of full torsos still together that hadn't deteriorated yet. In the next corner, there were three bodies hanging from the dirt ceiling. It looked like a man and two boys. They had been strung up by their arms and they were covered in blood. There were innumerable cuts and puncture wounds, but the most horrid sight were the many bites that were taken out of them. She collapsed and began to sob. I knew right away that this was her family. I'm so sorry, I said. She looked at me with a mix of hopelessness and rage. I tried to tell you not to come down here. She said with quiet forcefulness. I'm sure we can find some way to. She shook her head violently. You don't understand. She said looking me straight in the eyes for the first time. This is the trap. She stood up straight for the first time since I had seen her in the church. Took off my jacket and tossed it behind her. She was beautiful. Even though she was covered in filth. My children need food, she said, stretching out her arm. In an instant, two deformed creatures appeared and stood beside her. She stroked the thinning hair on their heads as they cooed at her. So, there was no woman in the camper, I said, trying to stall for time until I could come up with a plan. Oh no, there was a woman. She was taken to the birthing house. She will give my children their own children. Against her will, of course. She looked at me with disdain. She is a tool that we will use to survive. Just like my ancestors were treated as tools to be used in the mines. I glanced around the room and saw several more creatures emerge from the shadows and advance slowly toward me. I knew that I was trapped. My mind scrambled for some plan. Any plan to escape the horrors that awaited for me. 
I glanced at the three mangled bodies dangling from the ceiling and knew that would be my fate. I made my decision and I didn't hesitate to implement it. In a flash, I drew my pistol and I shot her in the forehead. The sound was still echoing when I started to run back to the passageway that I had come from. I hoped that the shock of seeing their mother die would give me a head start before the horde of creatures hunted me down and tore me to shreds. Time seemed to move in slow motion. I felt like I was running underwater. Every move, every step seemed incredibly slow. I knew that they would catch me, there was no doubt in my mind. It was only a matter of time. The only thing that kept me from giving up was the sheer will to live. I swung the flashlight as I ran making shadows jump and fly around. I arrived at the bottom of the stairs much sooner than I thought possible, and I threw myself up them two at a time praying that I didn't trip. The horde was hot on my heels, and I could hear them getting closer. The grunts and snarls spurred me on even faster. I felt something brush against my heel and I knew that I had to act. I didn't bother to look back. I fired two shots into the closest one. I heard the inhuman scream and the sound of falling bodies. I risked a glance back to see them all tumbling down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief as I reached the door and struggled to pry my knife out of the wood. After a few agonizingly long seconds it came free and I dove through the door. Much to my surprise and relief, the church was empty. They must have all gone another way to trap me below. I looked over at the dozens of glowing candles and ran straight toward them, knocking over as many as I could. I ran to the far wall and did the same on my way out of the door. Once I was through, I turned back and jammed my knife into the door as though they wouldn't open. I didn't waste time celebrating my close escape. I ran down the middle of the street so that I would have a good view of anybody or anything chasing me. It didn't take long until I heard footsteps behind. They sounded more like a pack of dogs chasing me. I glanced back and sure enough, there were half a dozen deformed creatures in hot pursuit against the backdrop of the church engulfed in flame. I took some solace in the fact that at least some of the unnatural things must have burned up in the blaze. I had a stitch in my side and my leg muscles burned, but I didn't dare slow down. Even at the speed that I was running, they were catching up. I wasn't sure if I would make it to the truck before they got me. It was going to be close. I reached the truck and breathed a sigh of relief that I hadn't locked it. By the time that I got the keys in the ignition and started it, they were on me. I locked the doors and slammed it into reverse as the first body flew into my windshield, shattering it. I got some momentum going as another landed on my hood and another grabbed my door handle. I swung the truck around and slammed on the brakes, sending them flying. I threw it in drive and stomped on the gas, spraying gravel. I hadn't gone more than a few yards when another freak landed in the truck bed and started pounding on the cabin roof. I could see the dance getting deeper. It would be through soon. Suddenly, the pounding stopped. I kept my eye on the road but turned to see what was happening. It smashed through my rear window, grabbing me by the neck. I swerved to try to break its grip, but to no avail. I could feel myself starting to black out. I knew that would be a death sentence. I pointed my gun out the window, but the creature grabbed it before I could aim at it. My mind raced faster than the truck that was hurtling down the dirt road at breakneck speed. I was seeing stars. I knew that it was a matter of minutes until the end, if not seconds. I squeezed the trigger. The gun went off right beside its head, missing it by a few inches. I was done. It howled in pain and fear at the sound and the heat of the round going off. Amazing the let go of the gun. I aimed it again and squeezed the trigger. Blood rained on me as its head snapped back and it fell into the bed of the truck with a heavy thump. I sat the gun on the seat beside me as I breathed huge gulps of air 
wiping the red out of my eyes. My vision returned just in time for the turn onto the main road. The tires screeched as they bit into the asphalt on the way to the ranger station. I got there shortly after sunrise, pulled into a parking space and sat back in the seat. Exhaustion and adrenaline crash sapped my energy and I fell asleep. I woke to the sound of someone knocking on my window. I whipped around, grabbed the gun off the seat and swung it back around to the window. Oh, whoa there, son. The older ranger said, raising his hands. One's got your panties in a bunch. I took a deep breath, lowered the gun in the window and then told him the whole story. The longer that I went, the more serious he became. Until the story was done, his face was made of granite. He stuck his hand in the window. Keys, he said. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and handed them to him. Go inside and get yourself cleaned up. I'll take care of this. I stepped out of the truck on shaky legs and walked into the ranger station, threw away my bloody uniform and took a long shower. By the time that I had finished and changed into a fresh uniform, the other ranger was back. He stepped inside the station and scanned the room until he found me. All taken care of, he said with a crooked smile. What do you mean? I said. Did you call the police? He looked around at the handful of rangers that were milling around the room trying to make it look like they weren't listening to our conversation. Yeah, we're not going to get the police involved in this, he said. What? Why not? He looked at me with an odd determination in his eyes. So you really killed her, did ya? He said. Of course, it was her or me. Most of the folks around here give that place a wide berth, he said. There are signs all over saying no trespassing in danger. You would think that it was almost natural selection for those who ignore all the warnings. But those travelers... And then there are others who visit the place on the down low, all quiet like. He said as if he hadn't said anything. Those folks might say you robbed them of their fun. You might even call them conjugal visits. There might even be some of those folks in this very room. I stared at him in disbelief and then looked around the room and saw every set of eyes focused on me. There wasn't a smile or even a hint of one that suggested that this was a joke. He clapped his hand on my shoulder. Why don't you head home and rest today, he said. You've had a long night. We'll take care of things. He ushered me toward the door, pausing before opening it. Just remember that nothing happened, he said. Because if the police get an anonymous phone call... We might have to drive out and grab a couple of children to come visit your house in the middle of the night. You get me? I nodded my head in a daze as he opened the door. That's the story I tell when people don't take the hint and stay away from the town. It's been years and every once in a while I hear of travelers that disappeared in that area. I shake my head and wonder... Is there anything spookier than missing a great sale? We don't think so. Thankfully, you caught this episode just in time for Ghost Beds, a big Memorial Day sale happening right now. The folks behind Ghost Bed have been making scary good mattresses for over 20 years and you can feel it when you sleep on one of their beds. They are built to last and designed for maximum comfort with signature and patented cooling technology. You can take their online quiz to get your personalized recommendation within minutes. Or if you want to talk to a real person instead, ghost bed sleep experts can dive deeper into your needs and help you find the right bed for your body. Orders ship fast and free and you'll get a 101 night sleep trial to make sure that your mattress is the right fit for you. Head to ghostbed.com slash creepscast and use promo code Mr. Creeps for 40% off all ghost bed mattresses plus two free luxury pillows. A few years ago, my grandfather went missing. 
I moved into his house immediately and when he was declared illegally gone after a while, I ended up inheriting it. It would lead to a terrible experience, one that I barely survived. For months after his disappearance, I had the same reoccurring dream. My grandfather, Chester Middleton, would be standing in the corner of the fields behind his house. His back turned to me. The night sky, a gray black and covered in clouds that rushed by. As if they had been previously recorded and now the video was played in fast forward. He had gone missing a few months ago and there had still been no sign of him or his body being found. Grandpa, I said, waking up behind him, shivering and barefoot. You're back. Not yet, Johnny, he said in his usual slow way. It was strange to have a conversation with someone's back, and I had to lean forward to hear his quiet words. But soon I will be. You will find me and bring me home. But how could I find you? It's so dark here. I said, squinting just to make out a silhouette. I moved closer to him. You'd be surprised at what you can find if you go looking in dark places, he said. And some of those things will also find you. He turned then, showing half of his face blown off the teeth and bone below showing off his eternally grinning skull. Look at how much they've changed me, Johnny. Look. He rubbed both of his gnarled calloused fingers over his face, a gesture that I had seen him do countless times. A waterfall of red had dripped down his body from his half-missing face, but the strange black soil where he stood drank up every drop instantly leaving no trace at all. I awoke, screaming and covered in sweat. I ripped the covers off and jumped out of bed pacing, looking out the window into the fields behind the house. I expected to see his shadow there, just like in the dream, but it was only dark fields extending on for acres. As time went on, this nightmare became a daily burden. I became afraid to go to sleep, and when I did, I fall into an exhausted slumber. I would always wake up screaming. The dream became longer and at the end, my grandfather would always point to a trail in the corner of the field, one that never existed as long as I had been living at that house. Sometimes it would start to rain, fire, or the trees along the borders of the field would begin to drip that red all over the ground. White rotted hands often reached out of the trail grasping at anything and everything yet finding no purchase. I tried taking sleeping pills, opioids, cannabis, heavy doses of alcohol and whatever else people said would give me a dreamless and peaceful sleep. But none of it worked. I lost weight, dark circles began to appear underneath my eyes, my face becoming more and more gaunt with the passing of the weeks. Even in my waking hours, I still saw my grandfather's face, the skull underneath, frozen in the endless smile of the dead. It became so bad that I began to consider things that I would have never thought of before. One of my friends from college had been heavily interested in the occult, eventually joining a secretive group known as the Golden Dawn, who were supposed practitioners of black magic. I called him up on FaceTime one afternoon, nearly hallucinating from sleep deprivation. The light seemed much brighter and I became tired after doing nearly anything. I went to work in a fugue-like state, and the days all blended together into one never-ending hallucinatory delirium. Johnny, buddy, how you doing? My friend Nathan said in a calm, detached demeanor that he nearly always used. You look a little rough around the edges. Uh, not good, I said, explaining how my grandfather had gone missing, and how my reoccurring nightmare of the secret trail had plagued me for weeks straight. Is this the house that your grandfather left you? The one where the small private graveyard was built on the border of the property? I paused, trying to remember if Nathan had ever been here to visit me. 
My mind moved sluggishly and memories came slowly to me now. And then I remembered that he had visited me once here during our first year at college. How did you remember that? I asked him, genuinely curious for the first time since beginning this conversation. He laughed. Don't you know who's buried there? Is it kind of famous or more likely infamous? He said. I shook my head. I have no idea what you're talking about, I said. Well, it was long before either you or I were born, back in the early 1900s. A farmer there had killed his whole family one night. They were snowed in and some people just think that he had gotten cabin fever. Maybe they're right, I don't know. His name was Harris McEwen and he went through the house, slitting the throats of his two daughters before moving on to his wife. None of them ever woke up or tried to fight back, at least according to the police. It's like they were all in a stupor or hypnotized, or maybe just drugged or something, I don't know. He ended his killing spree by writing a note in his own blood. It was a full rambling of lunacy, talking about how he needed to protect his family from demons who lived in the fields. But he also said that there was a secret trail back there that led somewhere else. Some dark, horrifying place where the dead don't stay dead, and the dirt of the trail itself drinks blood, forever thirsty for more. I paused, waiting for the punchline. Wait, are you serious right now? I asked. How did nobody ever tell me about what had happened to my house? And how do you know so much about it? May I grew up in this town too, he said. I listened and read, and clearly you did not. The history teacher at the high school knew all about it, as well as the members of the historical society. I guess you just never asked the right questions, or really, many questions at all. Is there anything that I can do about it? I asked. There was a long pause. I'll take a couple of others in the Golden Dawn, Nathan said. Maybe this weekend I can stay over and we'll figure out something. The rest of the week passed by slowly, but at least I had hope. I would see Nathan on Friday and maybe this would all be over. I could finally sleep again without waking up screaming every night. I could finally be at peace in my own house. Things got worse on Thursday night. I had the same reoccurring dream my grandfather pointing at the mysterious hidden trail and the trees all weeping red in an eerily lit twilight world. I was standing in the field one without warning, grasping hands latched onto my body forcibly pulling my left arm while digging into my skin with fingers that felt as hard as iron. I shrieked in mortal terror, spinning around. There was man in clothes that would have been in fashion around World War I, his teeth covered in red, small trickles of it running down his chin. His eyes were burning in their intensity, his dilated pupils staring into my face with an insane sheen. How much more must I bleed them? He asked, his voice sounding slurred and slowed. He kept having to stop and spit blood out. They told me if I blood them that I would find peace. How much more, man? I can't do this much longer. I cut their throats while they slept. I did everything they asked of me. So, why, why, why? Looking down at where he had grabbed my arm, I saw deep claw marks. I looked back up quickly at the man stepping back. His fingers were in reality white bone, sharpened to dagger-like blades. Harris McCune turned, the back of his head showing, and I saw right into his brains. It looked as if he had put a shotgun or a pistol directly into his mouth and took out the backside of his skull. There was an exit wound the size of an orange, giving me a perfect view of what had once been his brain and skull. Behind him, I saw a middle-aged woman and two teenage girls. They all had their throats cut, their dilated pupils staring straight at me as waterfalls of red ran down the front of their bodies. I bled them for the blind god, Harris McCune said. How much more blood does he need? At that point, I woke up in my bed, covered in sweat. 
A stinging sensation in my arm caused me to look down, where I saw the slash marks from his razor-sharp bone claws on my left arm. Nathan ended up showing with another woman that I had never met before. He said that she was a third order magus and one of the leading practitioners of both black and white magic in the southeastern United States. None of that meant anything to me, but I was glad that I was no longer alone dealing with this nightmare. Nathan always reminded me of some German super soldier, a topic that I made jokes about with him. He stood over six feet tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was a clear gym rat at that with huge arms and a thick chest. In contrast, the woman standing next to him was much shorter and older, though she didn't appear to have a wrinkle on her middle-aged face. Her hair was pure black and her eyes were wide and blue. This is Nora, Nathan said. I went to shake her hand, but she walked right past me, looking out into the cornfields. There's something different about this place, she said in an airy voice. I felt the need to roll my eyes, but I remembered that they had volunteered to come out of their way and spend the night simply to help me. And moreover, I remembered what desperate straits I was in. These people may be my only hope. And then she did something that sent chills down my spine. She pointed at the same spot my grandfather always pointed to in my dreams. The universe is thin here. It is a point where some may cross over or those beings from the astral worlds may enter into ours. I'm not surprised this house has been the scene of so much trouble. The killing of an entire family may not have been the cause of the thinning, but in effect. The dark spirits from the higher dimensions can use the weak minds of those afflicted by insanity, grave physical illness, or lifelong addiction to do their bidding. She stopped, taking a deep breath and closing her eyes. I didn't know if this was a part of some act or not, but I just stood there watching and waiting. After a few moments, she opened them again. I believe your grandfather somehow ended up in that same place. He's calling out for you, asking for help, or at least his spirit is. I believe his body is dead. So, what can I do? I asked. She looked at me, her large blue eyes as cold as ice. A shiver ran down my back and I turned away from her intense gaze. You can go and help him, young man. What else are you going to do? Leave him there for all eternity. With that, she turned her back to me, pulling her purple shawl closer around her neck. I saw a quick glimpse of a tattoo with a white eye built into the center of the pyramid on her wrist. Nathan and Nora went to his car, pulling out various ingredients to begin the ritual that they assured me would open up the trail to us. I saw Nora with an ancient-looking leather-bound tome whose title read, The Book of Gates. An hour later, we were assembled at the spot where the field had met the forest. A couple hundred feet to the left, the old balcony lay in a clearing in the woods. But where we all looked now was just a cluster of pricker bushes and trees. It looked impenetrable and swampy. Nathan began taking the necessary objects out of the box while Nora still held her spellbook. Thirteen black candles with human remains mixed into the wax. He said to me, smiling as he spread them out in a circle. He reached back into the box and pulled out a glass vial. Some dirt from the grave of a murderer. Next, he pulled out a branch, the flowering branch of Dadara. And last of all, he pulled out another glass vial, but this one was red. The blood of a murdered virgin. How did you get this stuff? I asked him. He looked at me with a half smile. Dadara grows wild around here. As for the rest, ask me no questions, brother, and I'll tell you no lies. Nora finally spoke, looking up from her spellbook at the moonlit sky. The time to perform the ritual is running out, she said. We must begin immediately. I will not recount here how the ingredients were used, and I do not wish to be responsible for anybody else trying to repeat the ritual. The horrors that ritual unleashed cannot be easily comprehended. As Nora finished speaking the last Latin incantation necessary to open the hidden trail, a feeling of anxiety and terror took over my heart. 
I wish that I could just run away at the moment and never come back to this cursed house, but it was just the house I knew. My grandfather might be out there and, if so, I needed to help him. One moment, I was looking at the thick wall of bushes, ferns, and swampland. As soon as I blinked my eyes, the trail was there with a soil as black as obsidian. I took a step back, falling on my back as I tripped over a candle. It's okay, it's okay, Nathan said, bending down to give me a hand. The ritual worked perfectly. We've opened the pathway. I looked up, squinting and peering down the black trail. Everything looked strange. The trees were not native to this region. They had dark red bark and thorns ran all up and down their exterior. Their leaves were curved into the shapes of a scythe, and the strangest of all, they exuded a resinous sap that trickled down their bark, a sap that looked like thick and dark blood. Nathan reached into his pack, pulling out two pistols. He handed one to me, giving me his crooked half-smile. Just in case, he said simply. I took it, making sure the safety was on. He handed me a simple chest holster as well, which I put on over my shirt. Nathan had an identical one under his jacket already, which he used to holster his pistol. Picking up his bag, he nodded at Nora and me. All right, let's do this, he said excitedly. Nora shook her head. You better tamp down your glee, young man, she said. There are things along that trail that would drive you insane simply by looking at them. There are things that would suck your blood out or dismember you while you're still alive. Remember, we are only going to get his grandfather out of there and then we leave immediately. If he's dead, we will free his spirit. If he's alive, then we'll grab him and guide him out. Understood? Nathan nodded, apologizing sheepishly. Keep an eye out also for what we seek. The bark of Zekum, the blood of the Ancient One, and the soil from the Endless Stairs. I found this curious, but I didn't ask about it at the time. And we started walking. The moment that we passed through the threshold of the trail, I could feel it. There was a buzzing noise like being directly underneath high voltage power lines, and a smell like ozone had filled the air. It wasn't unpleasant, but it seemed to indicate that whatever this place was, it was full of energy. As we walked further away from the threshold, I looked back, expecting to see the field and house in the distance. But to my surprise, there was only an endless, winding black trail behind me, leading into a group of desolate, rocky canyons that I had never seen before. Apparently, we were stuck here. Up ahead, I heard a chattering of teeth and a low moaning noise. We came across a sharp turn to the right, and a massive tree stood there hundreds of feet tall. It had no leaves or fruits. Instead, demonic heads hung from the branches, swaying softly in the wind. Their faces were flat and deflated looking, their eyes pure black or glowing red. They opened and closed their mouths slowly in time with the breeze, creating the constant chittering noise. It was as if they were freezing to death, even though the air was warm and humid. Nora put out a hand, stopping us abruptly in front of the tree. Beyond, I saw the black trail split into seven, some ascending and others descending. There were no signs or indications of which trail was the right one. The tree of Zakam, Nora said softly, looking at the strange fruit that the tree produced. As she said its name, the eyes of the demon heads all turned to look at her. Their expressions ranged from fury to disinterest to obvious pain. Their sunken emaciated faces then examined me and Nathan. Do you know the way? Nathan asked her. She shrugged, apparently unafraid of the horrific sight in front of us. They know the way, she said, pointing to the heads. We only need to ask them. I had my doubts about this, but said nothing. She stepped forward. Those who are one with the holy tree of Zakam, she said. We ask for your help. We are travelers lost on the trail. We look for one who has come here before us. 
an old man who came from the fields nearly four months ago. His name, she turned to me. His name is Chester Middleton. I said loudly and confidently stepping forward. He's my grandfather. He has gone missing from my world. Have you seen him? At first, nothing happened. Though the chattering of teeth stopped, hundreds of pairs of eyes focused on me in the utter silence. Not a bird sang or an insect hummed in the stillness. All at once, the mouths of every decapitated head opened, and a voice emerged from all of them simultaneously. It was deep and gurgling. We have seen the one you seek, they said in unison. Give us a sacrifice of blood and we will tell you the way. I looked at Nora, one eyebrow raised. She nodded at me, holding out a dagger. They want some of your blood to feed the tree, she said. I gaped at her. Just a little, just cut your arm or hand or whatever you feel like and leave a few drops of blood on the roots of the tree. They won't help us without a sacrifice from you, no matter how small that may seem. After all, you are the reason that we're here. I took her ceremonial dagger, gazing down at the rubies and opals that adorned the handle. The curved blade with strange hieroglyphs marking its steel surface. I did as she said. Walking up to the tree standing directly next to it, I realized just how huge it really was. I had seen the redwoods in California and this was taller than any of those. Its black bark looked ancient, with the deep gouges and cracks running up and down as far as the eye could see. I put my left arm out where the trunk disappeared into the soil, putting a small slash into the top of my skin. A small trickle of blood ran down my skin, dropping into the soil below. As soon as it touched the dark ground, the earth sucked it in. The trees seemed to sigh with pleasure, the heads all smiling at once in unison, their eyes all looking down at me. Your grandfather is on the seventh path, they said. Seven, the holy number, the number of strength and mysticism. Take no other path unless it is death that you seek, and you may find it regardless. And then they went silent, closing their mouths. A strong breeze blew down the path and they began to chatter again, returning to their previous expressions of mixed pleasure, pain, fury, and sadness. Nora stepped forward, taking the dagger back. She peeled a small piece of the black bark off of the tree, wrapping it in a silken cloth and placing it in her bag. I wiped the blood away on my shirt, returning to my group. We looked at the seven trails. I wondered what the first six held. Without hesitation though, we took the last one, walking forward to find my grandfather, or whatever was left of him in this cursed place. As we walked forward on the trail, we saw a flickering light up ahead, illuminating the blood red trees in a fiery glow. What is that? I asked Nathan and Nora. They walked in front of me side by side, quiet silhouettes in the dark night. A creeping sense of dread rolled through me. Whatever it is, it belongs to the trail, Nathan said. This trail is older than human civilization, older than humanity itself most likely. The ancient ones have long lived in the space between universes, hiding in plain sight, coming out when they need to feed. They used to feed on the pain and suffering of animals, but Ever since humans began to spread, they've grown accustomed to more sophisticated tastes, let's say. Many of the ancient stories are based on true places, Nora continued. The River Styx and the Ferryman Sharon, for example, were based on visions of the mystics from ancient times. The souls of the dead wander in places like this, eternally trying to cross over to the other side. Their loneliness and despair feeds the beings in this plane of existence. But we have protection against them, right? I said. They just kept walking, right? Well, some, Nathan admitted. But some of them might drive you mad just by looking at them. There is no such thing as guaranteed. Absolute protection in a place like this. 
I just hope the trees sent us on the right path, because the wrong path would lead to something far worse than just lost souls. The light grew brighter as we approached it. Soon, I could see a massive fire on the left side of the trail, blue and orange flames flickering off of it and illuminating everything around for hundreds of feet. In front of it stood a child. She looked only five or six years old. She had a little blue dress on with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. As I got closer, I saw that she had an ear-to-ear -ear grin on her face. Go slow, Nathan whispered back to me. Nora looked totally unfazed. She just stared down a few feet in front of her as if nothing was disturbing about this in any way. The child's head began to turn to the right and then it kept turning. It spun backwards on her head, the skin on her neck stretching as the bones cracked and the tendon snapped, then finished turning in a complete circle. Blood was pouring from her eyes now and her teeth had lengthened into points. Do you come to join the circle? She asked in a low and childish voice. We have many before you who have come and they still stay here. She pointed behind her to the fire which suddenly went out. I saw blackened, smoking corpses lying on the ground there, still moving their arms and trying to turn their heads. Their mouths opened in silent screams. We do not come for you, Nora said looking up and making eye contact with the demonic girl. And how do you know that we then do not come for you in return? She asked, her face staying forwards now, the skin still stretched around her neck in a disturbing and twisted manner. We do not appreciate visitors here. This is no place for the living. Her limbs seemed to lengthen, her broken neck stretching out as her eyes darkened to pure black. Fangs began to emerge from her mouth. The corpses behind her twitched and moaned, trying to scream, but their melted and damaged faces just made small gasping noises. The girl laughed as she transformed into a creature, straight out of my worst nightmares. All of her limbs were twisted, broken and oozing dark blood now. She began to walk towards us on legs where the bones poked out through the skin. Each step made a crunching and grinding sound as the broken bones rubbed together. Nora began to chant, her eyes rolling back in her head. The language was low, growling and hissing. It was like nothing that I had ever heard before. She reached in her pocket, grabbing the leather pouch and sending a shower of silver dust forward. The demonic girl screamed as it touched her. She began to revert from a mutated nightmarish creature back to the facade of a sweet little girl that she had taken when we first walked up here. Without hesitation, Nathan pulled out his gun and fired at her, hitting her in the stomach. The bullet went right through her small body, sending out a spray of flesh and bone from her back. The girl shrieked at him, her mouth disengaging and opening wide. Her cries were so loud that they made my ears ring. They seemed overlapping and continuous. And then she turned and ran, leaving behind drops of black blood as she fled the scene. Without hesitation, Nora pulled a small glass vial from the inside of her satchel. After a minute, she had succeeded in capturing some of the blood from the injured creature. It looked like oil in the glass, shimmering and sending off iridescent colors as it splashed back and forth across the vial's bottom surface. The blood of an ancient one, she said to herself, so quietly that I almost didn't hear her at all. I was badly shaken up. My hands trembled. The gun that Nathan had given me was out, but I didn't really have confidence that it could kill everything here. A little girl shot with this caliber should have been on the ground bleeding out but she had just been injured and was still able to run. As we walked past the moaning burnt bodies in the ground, Nathan bent over and put a bullet into the foreheads of each of them in turn. They stopped moving. I was glad. The girl had called these tortured souls her circle. How many more were there in this place just like them? 
I had wondered. I didn't have long to think about it though. The scenery was changing all around me. The dark red bleeding trees had begun to thin out and behind them. I saw endless fields stretching to the horizon in every direction. They weren't growing food, however. Crucifixes had been nailed into the ground in straight rows. Every single one had a body on it. There were thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands. It was impossible to tell. The lines made a sight almost like an optical illusion as the cross symbol was repeated over and over until they blurred together in the distance and disappeared. Men, women, and children bled from their hands and feet where they had been crucified, dripping fresh red into the earth below. Ropes had been tied around their arms and legs to add more strength to the bindings, and likely to keep the nails from just ripping right through their palms. They continuously tried to push themselves up from the slanted wooden block their feet were nailed to, taking in a breath as quickly as they could before slumping back down. This process repeated over and over, the endless suffocation, the pushing up, the collapse back down until eventually, the victims were too tired from exhaustion. At this point, their heads would loud and their eyelids would begin to shut, their lips turning blue as they suffocated on the cross. As I watched, I realized that many had already passed, and more were joining them every minute. Others looked fresher and some even screamed out to us begging for help, pleading for us to let them down and save them from this horrible fate. I looked over at Nathan who was walking directly beside me. Just ignore them, he said gruffly. They're not really alive, you know. You couldn't even help them if you tried. They belong here, Nora said. They feed the trail. The earth itself feeds on their blood and suffering here. Remember that you are only here for one. I nodded, refocusing myself. I had to find my grandfather. The moans and screams followed us for miles. The fields seemed to never end. The dark soil of the trail just twisted through them, serpentine and winding, until finally I saw a break up ahead. The trees had started up again and in the middle of the path, I saw a circular rung of black metal. Ah, good, Nora said. I thought we would never get here. Closing in, I saw the black metal was actually the railing for a staircase. The trail ended as suddenly as it had begun. A cluster of ferns and thorns grew wild beyond it, and the darkness of the forest was nearly impenetrable. I saw white eyes reflecting light back at me as I peered deeper inside. The eyes would have been numb bodies at least as tall as me, but no human eye ever reflected as such a silver glow in the dark. The endless stairs, Nathan said peering down. He wasn't exaggerating. As I looked at the circular railing spiraling down and down, they really did seem endless. Nora knelt beside the stairs, taking a knife and working off some of the grayish blue soil that started on the top rung and clung to every stair as far as the eye could see. She grabbed a vial and gently poured some of the strange substance into it, sealing it tightly and putting it into her satchel. I grabbed a huge rock from the nearby woods. Out of curiosity, I dropped it down the opening in the center of the circular staircase. It took off, falling faster and faster. Following its progress down so many stories gave me a sense of vertigo and nausea. I had to look away. I listened for a loud clanking noise or any indication that I had hit the bottom, but none came. After about 30 seconds, we all looked at each other. Let's do this quickly, she said. We have nearly everything that we need now. Nathan nodded. I wondered what exactly these two were plotting. What do you plan to do with all the stuff that you're collecting here? I asked. She shrugged. They're just rare and expensive ingredients. In my line of work, only a fool would waste such an opportunity. She averted her eyes as she spoke and I got the feeling that she was lying. Let's go, Nathan said, pressing the button to release his magazine and refilling it with bullets. This is by far the most dangerous part of the journey. 
Keep your wits about you and your gun out. We went down the stairs, each of us holding tightly to the railing. And the clanging of shoes against metal was the only sound besides the slight breeze that blew through, even down here under the earth. After what seemed like 20 minutes of descending, I saw an aberration in the staircase. A door was built into the wall with a strange symbol etched into the wood. It looked like a backward seven with a slash through it. The three of us stood in front of it, examining it. I pressed my hand against the door and realized that it wasn't made of wood. Using my flashlight, I examined it closely. The door was warm and pulsating. It appeared to be wrapped in human skin. I better open it, Nathan said to me. I looked up at him and then wrapped my hand around the knob. It was warm and pulsating just like the rest of the door. Without a second thought, I turned it and flung it open. We all peered inside. At first, it just looked like a curtain of blackness. I shone the flashlight, but it did no good. I walked through. It felt like thousands of small fingers were running along my skin as I entered. The sensation gave me chills. They were cold, hungry, grasping fingers, and they weren't used to the warmth and the light of the living. But after a few steps, the darkness broke, and I saw that I was standing in a long hallway. The floors, walls, and ceilings were all made of dark stone. Looking back, I saw Nathan and Nora emerge from the cloud of blackness. They nodded at me, looking pale and uncertain. This is the first circle, Nora said. We should find your grandfather somewhere around here. A room emerged on the left as we walked further in. I looked in, seeing the horrific scene from my nightmares. Harris McCune stood there, surrounded by the still living bodies of his family. His wife and daughters were choking on their blood and their lips were turning blue as they laid in bed. They tried to claw their way forward, ripping at the sheets and mattress, dyeing everything red. Harris turned to look at us, smiling. The back of his head was missing, but his face was intact. Finally, it is almost over, he said. You fools, you idiots. You woke him up. You woke up the blind god and now he's coming. He's coming, he's... Nathan didn't hesitate. He raised the pistol and started firing at Harris. Holes opened up all down Harris's chest and he stopped talking, looking down in surprise. A look of happiness crossed his face as he fell back his eyes fluttering then closing as an expression of peace came over his unmoving body. I had lost sight of his wife and daughters in the shootout. Looking down, I saw a little girl that crawled right up to me, her throat leaving a blood-red trail from the bed to my feet. Without hesitation, she reached a bony-clawed hand up and raked it down my leg. It shredded my pants and I felt the punctures go all the way into my muscle. She got me. I screamed, and started shooting blindly down at the ground. Blood poured down my leg. I stumbled back to the entrance, dragging my bad leg behind me as I went. The three of us got out of there and slammed the door shut. Wrong room, Nathan said, sweating heavily. He started laughing. I sat down and we wrapped a piece of cloth around my leg, tightening it to help stop the bleeding. Luckily, it hadn't punctured any major vessels and I could still walk, but it hurt like crazy. There was another room on the left. We opened it and it revealed what looked like a medieval castle's main chamber. Corpses had been skinned alive, their intestines out of their body and spiraling away from them, looking like snakes in the light glow of the castle's torchlight. And then, with mounting horror, I realized that they weren't corpses at all. The one closest to me had raised its head, its face totally missing, its eyes ripped out. I could see every muscle of its head as it tried to speak. The blind god is coming, it said. The blind god did this. The blind god is coming and you're next. It started coughing, trying to use its body to approach the door. The rest of the people did the same 
trying to push themselves up on legs without skin, pulling themselves over small pebbles in the floor that got stuck to them and started new small cuts all over their front. They started to reach their arms out towards us, pleading. Some had their tongues cut out, and they could only make indiscernible vowel sounds. Most of them wept, at least those who still had eyes. I felt transfixed. I stared at this mass of wretched humanity. Every single one of them was still somehow alive. The floor of the castle was covered in so much clotted, thick blood that a slight ripping sound occurred every time one of the people lifted an arm or leg up while crawling forward along the tacky stone. Nathan pulled me back, slamming the door shut. Uh, don't look in there, he said. There are endless rooms like that one. It'll serve you no purpose to go looking in there. But what if my grandfather is like one of them? What if he was in there? I felt feverish and panicked. Nathan shook his head. I doubt it, he said. He wouldn't elaborate. We kept walking forward down the hall. We found another room further down on the right. I opened it and to my amazement saw my grandfather's fields. He stood in the middle totally intact with his back to us. It reminded me of my dream. Grandpa! I yelled at him. He turned around and his face was half torn off. Oh my god, Johnny, he said, running up to me. The half of his face that was still intact formed a calm smile. I hugged him tight. How did you find me? Don't you worry about that. Are you okay? I asked. I immediately regretted asking it. What a stupid question, I thought to myself. My grandfather shook his head. I'm sorry, son, but I'm dead, he said. I was attacked in the fields and dragged here. I died on the way. Something tore half my face off. I didn't see what it was, but I remember dying. It was cold. And then I woke up here in these fields. But Johnny, I have to tell you, I'm not alone here. A chill ran down my spine at this. What do you mean, not alone? There's something coming, he said, looking back and pointing. I followed his finger. In the distance, I saw a tiny silhouette. I squinted, at trying to make it out. It floated above the ground, moving at a superhuman speed, coming closer to the door. Whatever it was, its eyes had been torn out, leaving only black sockets. It was naked, torn up, and shrieking. It looked at least ten feet tall, and its shiny black skin clung to its frame tightly. The noise that it made was so piercing that I tried to cover my ears as it got closer and closer, but it didn't help in the slightest. I could no longer hear what my grandfather said but I saw him mouthing the same word over and over. The blind God. We pulled my grandfather forward through the door and slammed it shut. I heard that shrieking, nearing faster and faster. I looked between Nathan and Nora. Nora was slowly taking ingredients out of her pack, as if there was no rush in the world. Ah, yes, she said, turning to Nathan quickly. This is the perfect spot for the ritual. I can feel the energy flowing through this hallway. Dozens of worlds colliding down here in the first circle. What a beautiful sight. What an absolutely powerful feeling. Nathan nodded, sweating heavily. His eyes darted back and forth down the hallway. And then we all heard the blind god on the other side of the door, very close now. His full attention turned to that, but Nora kept talking. I forgot to tell you, Nathan. Before I can transcend, I need one more ingredient. The blood of a betrayed friend. Smiling sweetly, she pulled out a knife and shoved it into Nathan's stomach as she spoke. He fell with a cry and she kicked his gun away. Slowly, methodically, she traced her fingers and the blood that poured out of him onto the stone floor, licking it off with a moan of pleasure. Hmm... <sighs> I love it when it's still warm. She knelt down, putting the fronts and backs of her hands in the puddle of blood until they were totally covered, looking like wet crimson gloves pulled tight over her normal skin. 
As Nathan crawled away, puddles of blood leaking out of him far too fast, she started the ritual. I started to raise the gun to shoot her, maybe in the leg or in the arm, to stop her from whatever madness she was preparing to unleash. But with a swish of her hand and a cry, I felt the gun ripped away from me and flung down the hallway. She was distracted, however, having already begun the ritual. My gun was far away now, but Nathan's was closer. Using the few seconds of distraction her focus on the ritual had allowed me, I sprinted over to it, grabbing it off the floor. As I ran towards it, I kept track of Nora out of the corner of my eye. She poured the demon child's blood from the vial in her mouth and then holding the blood under her tongue, blew the dust from the endless staircase in front of her. Holding out the piece of the tree of Zachum in front of her, she walked into the cloud of dust. The cloud seemed to sit there frozen in time, the particles reflecting the sunlight and shimmering, and yet neither moving in the breeze or descending towards the ground. Nora began to scream in pain as she reached the center of the cloud. Her eyes started to melt, dribbling down her cheeks. The skin and muscle holding her jaw in place did likewise, and the jaw fell down lower and lower, held on by increasingly thin tendons and pieces of flesh. The tree root had started to grow, sending out leafy shoots and thick dark roots in all directions of her body. Her milky white skin was soon totally covered in an impenetrable bark. She fell on her knees, vomiting up huge quantities of it. Soon it looked like pieces of her stomach and intestines were coming up as well. Her body was changing, morphing, growing before my very eyes. Her spine was stretching, the bones breaking and reforming. Pieces of bone shot out through her fingers and feet, very long and sharp. Soon all of her clothes had ripped away. She was crouched on the floor in a fetal position, sweating blood from the bark-like texture of her skin, as bony spines started to shoot out of her back. This clawed, a demonic figure looking nothing like the woman that I had come in here with. At that moment, the door was smashed into pieces, and the huge creature my grandfather had referred to as the Blind God came into the hallway. Bent double, it barely fit through the shattered door. It looked like a black, a poisonous snake had merged with a blind giant. Shreds of black robe still clung to its body in a few places, and giant reptilian claws jutted out of its hands and feet. With a shriek, it ran at the transformed Nora, biting at her and raking its claws across her back, puncturing the bark-like skin and sending rivers of red flowing out of her. She fought back with equal ferocity, biting with razor-sharp fangs and using her sharpened bony spikes to rip at every exposed area of flesh on the creature's body. Run, I said, grabbing my grandfather's shoulder and hauling him away. Nathan stumbled and fell, sending droplets of red scattering all over the earthen walls. He tried to follow, but he was slow, wavering, grabbing at his side as he coughed up frothy, bloody spit. We ran back up the staircase, past all the tortured souls who still screamed out for us. I saw another little girl blocking the trail. Stopping cold in my tracks, I pointed the gun at her. Without warning, I started firing, using up the entire magazine. Her head and chest had split open. Black, oily blood dripped out of her as she fell slowly backwards. A demonic grin still plastered across her face. I grabbed my grandfather and got us out of there. Even as I looked back, I saw some of her skin starting to stitch itself back together, though she still hadn't risen. But we had almost made it home. I could see the field of my grandfather's house in the distance at the end of the trail, a tiny pinpoint on the horizon that came closer and closer to us with every passing moment. My grandfather took my hand as we ran towards the entrance of the trail, squeezing it reassuringly. I was seeing spots from running so long, my chest had stitches all up and down it but it wasn't slowing down until I was safe and away from this insane place. You did the right thing, son, he said through gasps, tears running down the part of his face, blood streaming down the rest. 
I never deserved a grandson as good as you. And then we hit the invisible wall dividing my grandfather's property from this trail. As we ran through it, I felt his grip slacken and then release. Looking over, I saw his body rapidly fade, dissolving and blowing away in the wind. I had freedom from that cursed place. I looked back and to my total surprise saw Nathan still alive. He was a little off in the distance at least a quarter of a mile, limping slowly, his clothes covered in blood. He came through the barrier, collapsing in my arms, hyperventilating and in clear pain. Please, he said, help me, it hurts so bad. I laid him down in the soft dirt of the field and called an ambulance. I lit a cigarette as I waited, thinking about all the unbelievable things that had happened, wondering if Nora was still alive or if she were right now being tortured by that insane and blind monstrosity that we had encountered. But as I listened to Nathan's ragged breathing and moans of pain, I knew one thing for certain. I used to be afraid of my nightmares, waking up every night in a sweat, screaming at the darkness. But I'm not afraid of them anymore. Now I know waking life is so much worse. His shoulder was broken, the arm hanging limply at his side like a loose bag of sand. The sweat forced itself out of the pores in his face and skin peeled off the burns in his hands. It wasn't a good position to be in under the circumstances, and the situation didn't seem likely to improve. But he did have one thing working in his favor. He didn't care if he survived. Are you alright? I asked, cringing at the ludicrousness of the question. He looked up at me, his eyes swollen nearly shut. Yeah, I'm just peachy, he said, sarcasm dripping from every word. Sorry, I just don't know what else to say. Isn't much to say, is there? Unless you want to talk about. No, I said before he could finish the sentence. Let's talk about how we're going to get out of here. He leaned over, wincing as he did, and peeked over the side of the cliff. How about you give me a little shove? That should do the trick. Yeah, very funny. You know that I'm not going to do that. He glared at me. Well, then maybe I should give you a shove and make things quicker. How about we focus on the positive? You know this only ends one way. If you try to save me, you get killed in the process. Especially with... Hey, we don't know for sure, okay? I said packing up the supplies that we had and trying to form some kind of plan to keep us alive long enough to get to safety. Besides, we've been best friends since what? Grade school? If I haven't already been tempted to toss you off a cliff, I'm not going to start now. I stepped over to the edge and glanced down. The wind whipped me in the face, sending a chill through me. Even though it was spring, there was still enough chill in the air to make me shiver. I watched as the sun headed toward the horizon. It would be dark before we got out if I didn't hurry up. My right knee collapsed as he kicked me in the back of the leg. I stumbled, my knees hitting the ground hard, rolling me toward the edge. My hand shot out and grabbed the log, saving me from a horrible death hundreds of feet below. What the heck is wrong with you? I said, lying on the ground and breathing hard. I told you, this only ends one way. Might as well get it over with. I stared at him, not believing what I was hearing. You're serious, I said. I thought you were just being you. Look at me, I'm in excruciating pain. My shoulder's a mess and I have burns on my hands. And I'm not going to be able to climb down. And even if I could, there's no safety from. We have to try, I said. I didn't bring you here to die. I wish you wouldn't have brought me here at all. There was no way to know this was going to happen. He stared at me. Doubt filled his eyes. I turned away and focused on filling my pack with what I hoped was the right combination of supplies. I couldn't make the pack too heavy because... I needed to lower him down and possibly carry him too. I tied together all the rope that we had and double checked the knots. I clipped the carabiner to his climbing rag, 
checking to make sure that it was still intact and that the fire hadn't damaged it. I stepped back to admire my handiwork. He was doing the same. Really? He said. This is your big plan. Sure, I said, smiling. Proud of myself and my ingenuity. Why not just ring the dinner bell for every predator as you dangle me like a carrot? You know what, you're right, I said. It's not worth all this trouble. I raised my foot and shoved his good arm, sending him toppling over the edge of the cliff. I heard him scream as he fell then, then silence. Thank God, I said sighing. I was getting so tired of listening to his whining. I heard that, he said from over the edge. I stepped up and peered over. He was dangling there ten feet from the top of the ledge. Oh dang, I thought I had killed you, I said chuckling. He looked up and saw me peeking over. You actually did it, he said. Well, isn't that what you wanted? For me to throw you off the cliff. How's that working out for you? He glared daggers at me. Makes you appreciate life when you think you're about to die, doesn't it? I said. You'll pay for this. What, for saving your life? Okay, I'll take responsibility for that. I began the long, arduous process of lowering him down. I only hoped that I had enough robe. After a while, the strain took its toll. I was exhausted and sweaty. My hand slipped and I had to quickly recover to keep him from smashing into the ground. I managed to slow the rope at the cost of my hands getting rope burn. I tied it off to a tree and I leaned over to check on him. You okay? I yelled. I couldn't see exactly what he was doing. It looked like he had raised his arm but I couldn't tell. I grabbed my binoculars and peered down only to see that he was giving me the finger. Hey, back at ya, I yelled. I need to take a breather. Are you going to be alright for a few minutes? His answer was to slump his head. I guessed that he was taking a nap. I sat next to the log and got out a bottle of water, taking a long drink. After a few minutes, I pulled out my knife and cut some strips off the bottom of my shirt and wrapped them around the palms of my hands and tied them off. Why didn't I think of that before I started lowering him? I thought. I was about to start another session of lowering when I saw the rope vibrating. Huh, that's weird, I thought. What are you doing down there? I yelled, stepping to the edge and looking down. My spine turned to ice when I saw nothing. He wasn't there. Adrian, I yelled. No response. Adrian! I yelled again, quickly pushing away thoughts of the Rocky movies. I pulled the rope and it came up with no resistance. I reeled in the entire length and at the end, there was no sign of Adrian. The rope didn't look like it had been cut. It looked like it had been torn or chewed. I stared at it for a long time. Memories of the horrible events that led up to this moment overwhelmed me. I collapsed to the ground in fear. My eyes darted around like my head was on a swivel. Every tree became a hiding place for that thing. I could feel it lurking in every bush. My mind started replaying when the trouble had first started. We made it to the top of the cliff and celebrated by starting a campfire and making some coffee while we set up our tents. Adrian was actually in a good mood if you can imagine, and we stayed up by the fire until well after midnight. The following morning, his mood had changed. Way to keep me up all night, he said, pouring a fresh cup of coffee and looking like he needed it. What are you talking about? Oh, don't play innocent, he said. You know you were hanging around my tent, circling it late last night, growling and pawing the ground. Yeah, trying to scare me. My eyes went wide as he talked. I swear, I was in my tent the whole time. I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. Then what was making all that racket? He said with doubt creeping into his eyes. Uh, maybe I was snoring and you heard that. Trust me, this wasn't a snore. Well, if it wasn't me then, I narrowed eyes at him. 
Wait a minute. I know what you're doing. What am I doing? He said, looking at his coffee cup. You're trying to scare me with some campfire ghost story hoping that I would wig out. I'm telling you, it's not some campfire story. It really happened. Yeah, okay. It said making it clear that I didn't believe a single word. I mean it, he said, starting to get angry. Okay, I said. Don't get your panties in a bunch. You better. He started saying and then stopped. His eyes were focused on something behind me. I'm not falling for that, I said, refusing to look until I heard a branch snap behind me. I turned and saw. I shook my head to clear the memory. I don't want to think about that right now, I told myself. I need to focus on finding out what happened to Adrian. I stood and checked my supplies and then double checked to be sure the rope was securely tied to the tree. I avoided looking around for fear of what might be lurking. Then, once everything was set, I stared down at the deadly ground that waited for me to make a mistake, muttered a quick prayer and then jumped off the cliff. Repelling down was more difficult with a pack on my back and rags wrapped around my already rope-burned hands. I took it slow, working my way down the same way that Adrian had gone. I also went slow for fear of finding what I didn't want to find. I knew it was possible, so I made sure to be as quiet as I could. The rock face was rough, and I did my best to not knock loose any pebbles or do anything that would announce my presence. In a best-case scenario, his rope got frayed on the rocks and it broke. I hoped that I would find him laying on an outcropping nearby, unconscious but alive. As I descended, I noticed an opening in the rock wall. My rope was in a straight line with it. I imagined Adrian's rope was too. I stopped and swung myself over to the rock face, grabbing a bigger rock and pulling myself to it. I pulled my rope up and stashed it, and then climbed down the side of the opening. There was a small ledge in front of it that I had landed on and peered inside. It was dark as pitch, even though the sun had just set. It seemed like daylight couldn't penetrate the darkness. I pulled on my flashlight and slowly explored the opening with it. It turned out to be a large cave. I stepped inside and walking upright, my head easily cleared the ceiling by a good at three feet. Curiosity overtook me as I shined the light around this newfound hall of mysteries. There were no markings on the walls and the floor was rough like the cave had formed in naturally instead of somebody making it. But then, why would somebody make a cave halfway up a cliff face where it's nearly impossible to get to? I wasn't sure that I really wanted to know the answer. As I continued inside, the air became cooler. I hugged myself and I fought off a chill. This cave was much bigger than I originally thought. I walked a short distance before I noticed the smell. Actually, it was two smells that intertwined with each other. The first was the smell of fire. Not like a rushing wildfire coming to burn me to a crisp, but more like a campfire. The second smell was much less encouraging. It was the smell of decay. Some animal had died in here. There was no doubt about it. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if perhaps I had explored far enough. My wondering ceased when I remembered why I was here in the first place. Adrian was still missing. If he had come down here, it didn't seem like he was coerced. At least I didn't see any sign of drag marks on the ground or a struggle. But then again, it was hard to tell on the rough rock floor. I suddenly stopped, unsure of what to do. The passageway split in two, and I shone my light at the right one and then the left. Neither seemed to show any clue of which was the correct path. I stared at each for a long moment and then mentally flipped a coin and went right. As soon as I took a few steps, I could feel the strong wind blowing in my face, carrying the smells of fire and rot with it. I nearly backed up and took the other path, but this was where I would most likely find Adrian. At least I hoped I would. As I walked, I noticed a slight glow ahead. 
I turned off my flashlight and followed the ever-increasing light. When I turned the corner, I saw Adrian lying on the ground in front of the fire. He didn't seem to be injured well, at least not any more than he already was. I didn't see any blood near him. I did, however, see a pile of bones tossed in the corner behind him. It disturbed me to see the pile and think about my friend's bones eventually laying there. I took a step forward to go check on him and then suddenly stopped. The huge rock that had been sitting by the fire had suddenly moved. I recognized it right away from the size and the color of the hair that covered it. I stepped back out of view and began shaking. I knew that I only had two options. Kill this thing or hide from it. There was nothing in my bag that would kill it. I didn't have a gun with me and I doubted a pocket knife would do the trick. I had to find somewhere to hide until it left. My mind ran in circles trying to think of a hiding place when it dawned on me. I turned and went back to the other passageway as quietly as I could. Once there, I stepped inside thinking it would be a long cavern like its counterpart. However, it was almost immediately blocked. I shone my flashlight on the blockage and was horrified to find that it was piled up with clothes. Shirts, pants, shoes, and even the occasional backpack. It was all piled in nearly to the ceiling of the cave. And more disturbingly, each article had blood on it. There didn't seem to be any of that escaped damage either. Most were ripped or chewed, probably like their unfortunate owners. I remember hearing about hikers going missing in this park, but I thought it was just normal stuff like in any other park. People get lost or fall into some hidden crevice or ravine. I guess not. My mind screamed for me to get out of there, fast, but I needed to know that Adrian was okay, and somehow try to rescue him too, although at the moment that seemed impossible. The longer that I stared at the clothes of these poor helpless victims, the more it formed into an idea. I grabbed some of the clothes and pushed them aside, digging my way toward the bottom of the seemingly endless pile. I wondered how many missing people it took before a major investigation started. I reached the bottom and took my pack off, setting it beside me, and then I pulled clothes down on top of me, leaving a small space for me to peek out through. There was just a hint of light coming from the mouth of the cave, but it was rapidly dwindling. I slowly unzipped all the zippers on my pack so I had easy access without making a sound when I needed something. I settled in and tried to make a comfortable seat out of the clothes. My conscience was not happy using the clothes of murder victims for comfort, but I saw no alternative. If I ran, that thing would hunt me down. It already found us once. I must have been more tired than I thought. Once settled in, I fell asleep almost immediately. I turned and it was there. I wasn't even sure what it was. It was dark and hairy, and it stood on its back legs but hunched over as if readying for an attack. I was petrified. Adrian, I said. What? he asked. Is that what you heard? Yeah, I'm thinking so, he said quietly, barely moving his mouth as if the monster wouldn't attack if you didn't speak. What do we do? I said through clenched teeth. How the heck should I know? It was circling us and moving closer at the same time. Its sharp teeth dripped with drool. Did you bring a gun? I said. No, did you? I slowly shook my head. It stopped and looked at me as though it understood the whole conversation. It stopped lurching and stood to its full height. It must have been at least eight feet. It lunged at me with incredible speed. I screamed and tried to run, but my foot got caught on the log and I fell over backwards, knocking the wind out of me. In the end, that was a good thing. The monster lunged at my torso, but since I fell, my torso was laying on the ground with the rest of me. It flew through the air, sailing right over me. I looked over at Adrian and saw his pocket knife in his hand. The monster saw it too. It narrowed its eyes at him and snapped its jaws. 
I was surprised by how much its head and snout reminded me of a dog. This was my thought as I lay there on my back, helpless, unable to breathe. I watched as it lunged at Adrian. I saw him plunge the knife into its chest and it howled in pain. It never slowed even as he stabbed it. It merely twisted in the air as it grabbed his arms, pinning them to his side. I heard the crunch as they both landed together on top of Adrian's shoulder. He screamed as they continued to roll right into the fire. Adrian tried to push his way out of the flames, severely burning his hand by grabbing a burning piece of wood and swinging it in a huge arc, smashing it right into the face of the monster. It whimpered and growled, and then disappeared as quickly and silently as it came. It took me a while to be able to move. When I could, I crawled over to Adrian who was laying still beside the fire. Are you okay? I said rolling him onto his back. He screamed in pain as I rolled him onto his injured shoulder. Uh, sorry, I said. Get away from me. He said as I helped him to a sitting position and looked at his burned hand. Are you alright? I said. Yeah, I'm just peachy. I woke with a start but didn't know why. I reached for my flashlight and was about to turn it on when I heard the sound of sniffing. I froze. Every ounce of concentration was on being as still as possible. The sniffing got louder. I didn't dare even open my eyes for fear that it would somehow see them and that would be it. I could feel its presence getting closer. I fought back the panic that would make me do something stupid like try to run. I just closed my eyes and thought about the last sunrise that I had seen, hoping that it wouldn't be the last one I would ever see. I felt the snout touch the layer of clothes right in front of me, and then it paused as if it was deciding if it wanted to eat me now or save me for a snack later on. The monster withdrew so silently that I barely knew that it was gone. I waited for it to return. I knew it was waiting for me to make a move so it could catch me, but I didn't. I sat as still as a statue for what seemed like hours. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to move. I had to stretch. I stood and stretched my arms and legs, but still quiet. When I sat back down and made sure that I was covered by clothes, I risked a little bit of light through my hand to get a bite to eat. Opening a granola bar without making noise is a tedious job at best. It took me a half hour and after I ate, my only reward was thirst. I sipped on my bottle of water, avoiding the temptation to gulp it down. I didn't know when I would be able to fill it. I checked my watch and it was one in the morning. At the same time, Adrian had heard the growling. I took a chance that this thing would be out hunting at night. I pushed my layer of clothes off of me and grabbed my flashlight and I went to check on Adrienne. I stepped carefully and kept my light pointed at the ground just in case. My ears strained to hear any sounds. Of course, there were the echoes of my footsteps, making me whip around thinking the monster was right behind me. I made it to the main cave without having a full-on panic attack. The fire had burned low and a dull orange glow lit the walls. I found Adrian lying in the same spot as before. He didn't seem to be moving. I leaned down and listened for breathing. I could hear a faint breath. Adrian, I whispered, shaking him. Come on, man, we gotta go. He moved a little. Adrian, I said, looking around to be sure that it wasn't sneaking up on me. Adrian, come on. He opened his eyes, just a slit, and put his hand up to shade his eyes from the light. You still with me, buddy? I said. He tried to speak, but nothing came out. Here, drink a little water. I gave him a few sips, and he perked up a little. Why? He rasped. Why what, buddy? Why are you here? I came to rescue you. Leave me. I'm not going to do that. In the distance, I heard a howl. It chilled me to the bone. 
I wondered how far away it was and if it was celebrating another victim. Okay, listen, I'm gonna go, but I'll be back when I'm sure it's out of the cave. I gave him another drink. You hang on, okay? He closed his eyes and laid his head back down. I stared at him for a moment and then I jumped up and ran out of the cave. I turned at the fork and buried myself back under the clothes, turning off the light as soon as I was set. It wasn't five minutes later that I heard something lumber by in the cave. I had cut it way too close. I needed to take mental notes of when it went out. I stole a glance at my watch. It was 1.37 in the morning. I drank the last swallow of water and I laid down in my nest of clothes. I woke up sometime later. The cave was dimly lit. I could see a bright light coming from the opening, but it didn't penetrate all the way to my nest. I could see the walls near the opening, but not much else. As I watched, a massive shadow blocked my view. It was standing right in front of me. I became still as a stone. What was it doing? Did it know that I was there or was it toying with me? Sweat poured off my brow. I knew that I was about to die. I gripped my flashlight tight knowing that it wouldn't do much to the monster, but at least I would go down fighting. And then something fell on top of me. It wasn't very heavy so I knew that it wasn't the monster. I waited for a long moment until I heard it walk away before I used the flashlight to see what was on top of me. I shone the light in the pile and I found new clothes. There was a shirt, shorts, underwear, and a bra. I knew it from the monster's latest victim. My heart went out to that poor woman. I wished there was something that I could do to help her, but there wasn't. I was barely surviving myself. My water was gone. I had three granola bars left, and that was the last of my food. I had to do something before I didn't have the energy to escape. This was my last chance. Usually, the monster kept to a schedule. I assumed governed by hunger and thirst. I knew that it wouldn't go out again for hours and I could leave. I could sneak out and be gone without it knowing that I was ever here. But I couldn't. I had to rescue Adrian. But why, my mind said. Well, because he's my friend, I thought. Would he leave you behind? Of course not, he would be doing exactly what I'm doing now. Oh really, that's why I tried to trip you and throw you off the cliff. That wasn't real, he was joking around. Well, he didn't seem like he was joking. He seemed like he wanted to die and take you with him. He was upset. How upset do you think he'd be waiting here in this cave to rescue you? Oh very, he'd probably be waking out. He never was much for small places. Do you think he would have left by now? Yeah, maybe, but the important thing is, I'm not him. Well, you could leave right now. No. Who cares if you save your friend and die in the process? I do. Do you really think that thing doesn't know you're here? What? That thing is playing you. It's stalking you. Waiting for you to make a mistake. No, I've outsmarted it. I've learned its routine. Yeah, I keep thinking that. Maybe you can outsmart its teeth as it's chewing you to pieces. I'm not leaving yet. End of conversation. I waited for a response that never came. Even though I decided to wait, there were things that still bothered me. Was it toying with me? Did it really not know that I was here? Why hadn't it killed Adrian yet? Was it leaving him alive to bait me in? The more that I thought about such things, the more I felt panic rising inside me. I pushed the clothes aside and the dull glow shone from the mouth of the cave. It called to me. It told me that the coast was clear and that I needed to go right now. I felt my muscles tighten, getting ready to rise and run out of the cave. I pushed the clothes over more, clearing a path, when suddenly I heard something. I quickly and quietly buried myself under the clothes. I had barely stopped moving when I heard the monster lumber through. It paused in front of the clothes sniffing the air, 
and then turned back toward the mouth of the cave and disappeared. I waited for a full minute before I breathed a sigh of relief. My own ingenuity had nearly gotten me killed. I was sure that thing wouldn't be going back outside for hours and yet it had left within minutes. I began to doubt myself on my own intelligence for taking such a risk. It was time to leave. I dug out from under the clothes and started for the mouth of the cave, and then I stopped and turned back. I had to try one more time to get Adrian out. I went deeper into the cave to the main room with the fire pit. There was a freshly made fire which told me that I didn't have much time. Adrian was still lying there beside the fire and I went to him and leaned down. Hey, time to go buddy, I whispered. He didn't answer me back. I know it's going to be tough but you need to try. I grabbed his shoulders and gently shook him. Come on man, you gotta wake up. His eyes didn't open. Something about his shoulders felt wrong. Aside from the fact that one of them was either dislocated or broken and should have caused him excruciating pain, he didn't twitch. The other thing was that the shoulders felt cold, not just a little chilly, but they were stone cold. Adrian, I pressed my fingers against his neck and felt for a pulse. There was nothing. His neck felt cold as well. I pushed him and his body clumsily rolled over onto his back. I tried to move his arms and legs, but I couldn't. Rigor mortis had already said it. I stared in disbelief. My friend was gone. Not only was my friend gone, but I had wasted all this time trying to rescue him. Maybe I had killed myself in the process. I wiped the tears from my cheeks and pulled Adrian's body back into the same position. My only chance was for this horrible monster not to know that I was here. I stood next to the fire letting the smoke wash over me in the hope that it might somehow cover my scent. After a couple of minutes I looked back over at my friend, said a silent goodbye and walked back out of the cave. I stopped at my hiding place and climbed inside, hoping this would be the last time I waited for death to pass by. I settled in and took a nap to prepare for my escape. A short while later I woke up hearing the monster pass by. I waited. When I thought that it was time, I slowly and silently packed my backpack and then stood to leave. As strange as it sounds, I knew that I would miss this place. It had been a refuge of safety for the last two days, even though it was a constant reminder of death. I stood at the edge of the pile and tried to rearrange them so that nothing looked amiss. And then I turned toward the mouth of the cave and started making my way out. It was late afternoon and the sun shone brightly in my face, blinding me. I hadn't realized how bright the sun was until I was without it for a couple of days. As I stood at the mouth of the cave, my first problem had presented itself. I looked over the edge and it was a good 50 to 80 feet to the ground. That would be why people left the cave alone. They couldn't get to it. I searched the surroundings looking for a solution when one had presented itself. There were vines hanging from the trees that looked like they might support me. The problem was as they weren't in reach. My arm would need to be a foot or so longer. They sat so tantalizingly close that I had to try leaning out to grab one. That ended when I nearly stumbled off the ledge and fell to my death. I searched for any other way, but there was none. I just had to go for it. I backed up a few steps and then took a deep, cleansing breath and ran. I jumped at the last minute and grabbed for the vines. My hands wrapped around them, but I was already falling and I had to wrap my legs around them too and squeeze for all I was worth to slow my descent. My hands and legs were burning as they slowed me, but I didn't dare scream. The cave was still too close. Even sliding down the vines may have been too loud. My hands were failing. I didn't know how much longer I could hang on. My fingers let go one by one and I fell. I landed on my back and the backpack cushioned my fall. 
Fortunately, I had only been around ten feet from the ground when I did. It still knocked the wind out of me and left me laying there helpless as I looked back up at the cave opening. Only I could no longer see it. It must have been invisible from ground level. Once I could breathe again, I focused on getting out of here. I stood and tried to get my bearings. The sun was setting, so I knew which way west was. It was around two miles to the south where the trailhead was. My car, my salvation, waited there for me. I made my way through the trees and headed south when there was an opening. Before I knew it, I had to run across a trail. I stepped onto it, feeling more relieved than I had in days. And then I heard something in the brush behind me. I froze. I turned toward the sound and saw the predator. It was a mountain lion, not the horrible monster that I had just escaped. But it didn't matter if this cat was hungry, I would be just as dead. I tried to nonchalantly continue walking on the trail, hoping that it would lose interest. My walk turned into a power walk and still the lion followed. It seemed to be closing the distance between us without breaking into a run yet. I tried to remember what to do in case of a mountain lion attack, but all I remembered was, don't run. I thought of this as I power walked away from the pursuing cat that was getting closer by the minute. Suddenly, I was hit from behind. The lion had jumped on me, but fortunately it had jumped on my pack. Its weight held me down, making me helpless as it climbed up my pack heading for the neck. I covered my head and neck hoping to survive. I could feel its hot breath against my fingers. I knew an attack was imminent. And then it stopped. It lifted its head and I could hear it sniffing the air. In an instant, it leaped off of me and was gone. I sat up and looked around, not believing my luck when I noticed the forest had gone silent. The only reason a predator runs away like that is there's a bigger predator in the area. My mind reminded me. I had a very good idea which predator had scared it off. This was it. Fight or flight. I jumped up and ran at full speed sprint down the trail. I didn't know that I had that much energy left after the last few days, but death sure is a great motivator. And I knew this thing wasn't coming to congratulate me for escaping its lair. My legs burned. I had a stitch in my side. My backpack was throwing off my balance and I nearly fell. But I could see the trailhead. There was a glint of metal that was on the front bumper of my car. All I had to do was keep going. I could hear panting behind me. My footsteps weren't the only ones running on the trail. It sounded more like a gallop behind me. For a fleeting moment, I almost stopped to see if I was being chased by a horse, but I knew that would be a fatal mistake. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the keys, pressing the button and unlocking the doors. I didn't want to make the same mistake that I had seen in dozens of horror movies. I was one of the ones screaming the loudest when the victim had dropped the keys. I ripped open the driver's door and dove inside. I had just shut it when a nightmare landed on the hood. I stared at it for a moment, transfixed by this horrific apparition. It looked like somebody had taken a dog and turned it into a horrible beast. It was massive, at least eight feet tall. Its fangs were sharp and red. They drooled onto the windshield as the red eyes stared at me. It reached back with its paw and smashed into my windshield nearly breaking through. I woke from my stupor and started the car as it smashed the windshield again, this time actually breaking through. It shoved its snout inside and snapped at me as I put the car in reverse and floored it, turning hard and making the beast tumble off to the ground. I threw it in drive and stomped the pedal to the floor. The car lurched forward with rubber screeching in protest. I gained momentum when the monster landed on the roof with a crash. It began pounding over and over. I saw claw marks coming through the metal and into the cloth on the ceiling. In desperation, I began swarming back and forth, trying to shake the monster loose. Metal and rubber protested at my maneuvers with the extra weight on top. I wondered if the car would flip and end my escape in bloody fashion. 
So far the road had been a park drive that was never meant for such speeds. I knew that there was a hard turn coming up and I wouldn't make it as fast as I was driving. I slammed on the brakes, sending the monster flying. I stomped on the gas and swerved around continuing to gain speed. As tempting as it was, I knew if I had tried to run it over, my car would never survive. And right now, survival was all that mattered. I looked in the rearview mirror and didn't possibly. It was catching up to me. I saw it leave, trying to land in the car again, but I swerved in time, leaving it only asphalt to land on. I made another hard turn and I was on a state road. The monster followed me, but I was able to get enough speed to finally escape. I breathed a sigh of relief as I sped toward town. I didn't bother going home. I went straight to the police department. After waiting a half hour to make it to the front desk, I was finally interviewed by an officer. When I started my story, he seemed to be only mildly interested. And by the time that I was done, there were six officers standing around listening. That was one heck of a story, the officer said, looking around at the other officer, smirking. It's true, I said. The officer sighed as the others dispersed. I'm sorry, son, as entertaining as that was, I'm too busy to go chasing around the woods hunting after some urban legend. I took a piece of paper off his notepad and wrote down a series of numbers. What's this? He said when I handed it to him. I had a GPS with me, I said. Those numbers are the location of the cave that has all the evidence you need. Listen, son, without something concrete, there's no one who's going to go out to the middle of the woods chasing a fairy tale. Well, maybe that'll help. I said getting up and setting my backpack on his desk. I opened the zippers and dumped clothes out to them. Whoa, 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 what is this? Concrete, I said. These are the clothes of this thing's victims. If you take DNA samples from the sweat and blood on them, you might find matches to some people who have recently gone missing. You're serious, he said, looking from the clothes to me as if just waking up. Yes, I said as I got up and started toward the door, if it's not too much trouble. I walked out leaving several officers staring at the pile of clothes. I got into my destroyed car hoping that it would start and I headed home. The entire way I kept glancing in the rearview mirror. After all this, there were two things that captured my thoughts. One, I would be barricading my house as soon as I got home. And two, I wouldn't be sleeping soundly ever again. When I first got the call to say that, I had been left to pub as inheritance. I didn't believe it. My parents had died while I was young and I grew up in foster care, not knowing any of my relatives. When I was then told that the pub, previously belonging to my estranged spinster, Aunt Darlene, was called the Pickled Gnome, I almost laughed the solicitor off the telephone. A few days after the call, legal documents were dropped through my letterbox. Despite my initial concerns, everything seemed to be legit. I was to deal with a solicitor named Norman, who was the executor of Aunt Darlene's will. The Pickle Gnome was situated by a city park, in a residential area with a few tower blocks and some council housing. I had always been a small town girl. None of the foster parents I lived with were from a built up area. It came with a three-bedroom apartment upstairs, a huge alcohol cellar, and a quaint little beer garden. I didn't know the first thing about running a pub. The gnome was miles away from my home and I had never met or heard of Aunt Arlene. But as I held the deeds and sat on the bed of my rented studio flat, staring at the flaking magnolia walls, I made a decision to change my life. I packed up all of my worldly belongings, totally in one suitcase, and prepared my cat, Cheeses, for our new life. The gnome wasn't what you would imagine when you hear of a city pub. It was like a strange relic, an antique of old Britain frozen in time. It was pretty much a local pub, with no other drinking establishments on its side of the park, and it had a thriving local community around it. 
Norman assured me that the business was perfectly viable, that I should be able to live quite comfortably in fact. The whole interior was wooden. There were hops strung across the ceiling, and vintage spirit bottles filled with lights decorated in the interior. The bar was a deep mahogany, the varnish atop well worn, showing chips and scratches. At the end of the bar sat a small statue of a gnome laid on his back with his feet in the air. Looking truly pickled, Norman winked, laughing a little bit too much at his own poor joke. The walls were covered in colorful, abstract paintings. Norman informed me that my aunt had been a keen painter and most of the artwork was her own. He showed me up to the apartment, and I wished that her artistic flair had stretched to that too. Unfortunately, it didn't. In fitting with the atmosphere of the pub, the home upstairs was like its own time capsule, this time of gaudy 70s decor. It wasn't to my taste, but I was grateful that I no longer had to sleep in my kitchen. Most of the furniture had been left behind. I was relieved that I didn't have to buy it. The apartment was spacious and light, and it had potential. Aunt Arlene had even left a slightly battered yet glorious looking cactus by the living room window that I looked forward to rescuing. I wished Norman a nice day and settled into my new home. Cheeses had loved exploring the bar and all the nooks and crannies underneath it. I started to warm to the idea of running this place. Imagining me and Cheeses serving all the locals, not having to worry about money anymore. I felt so blessed. Getting the gnome ready to open was hard work. It took about a month of deep cleaning and getting a personal license and suppliers organized. Aunt Darlene had left the business in a healthy place. I was able to get everything done without it costing me anything. She had also left behind a permanent staff member, Douglas, who I opted to keep on. Douglas was an older man, but not yet nearing retirement age. He had graying hair and a rotund exterior, and claimed to have worked for my aunt for 10 years. He couldn't wait to get the place up and running again, and told me how much the regulars had been missing it. Douglas was a godsend. He showed me all the quirks of the pumps and how to operate and work with the traditional pub systems. Jesus loved him. She would purr and butt her head against his legs whenever he was in the room. I believe you should always take note of what your pet thinks of a person. So, he was good in my books. The night that I finally opened the doors, it was such a relief. I didn't want to change much. I wanted to keep the same vibe that Darlene had. Douglas told me the gnome was like a home away from home. A living room that you could get a drink in. I liked that, and I had no intention of destroying it. My life had been pretty miserable before this happened and I had been handed a golden opportunity, and I wasn't about to destroy it. I patted the statue at the bar as Douglas unlocked the front door. Immediately, a small influx of people entered and occupied the various tables and bar stools dotted around. Doug had done a great job at spreading the word. A disheveled-looking, elderly man wearing a beanie hat sat at the bar stool closest to the statue of the gnome, and he huffed loudly. He was unshaven and had tufts of hair sticking out of his hat, but despite his appearance, there was a huge grin on his face. Oh, Grebbles, how I've missed you, mate. He boomed, staring lovingly at the gnome he had since picked up off the bar. Douglas emerged from out of the back instantly at the sound of the gentleman's voice. Jimmy, good to see you back in position, he exclaimed, shaking the man's hand vigorously from across the bar. How have you been? Well, not too bad, Doug. But I've been losing my marbles trapped inside all the time. Still gutted about our Darl as well. Jimmy paused with the sadness and side-eyed me. Well, aren't you going to introduce me to our new landlady? Douglas slapped his hand out of my shoulder and pulled me in closer. Oh, of course. How rude of me. And Jimmy, this is Carmilla, Darlene's niece and the new owner of the gnome. He turned to face me as Jimmy continued to give me the side eye. Carmilla, this is Jimmy. He practically lives here. Don't worry, it'll warm up to ya. 
I think he was expecting Dar to leave the place to him, as he's here so often. He burst into ferocious laughter, and I smiled nervously as I realized I had just inherited an entire community of people who might not be so welcoming. Nice to meet you. I managed. I kicked myself. Landladies were supposed to be charismatic, but I could barely say hello. I didn't know Darl had a niece, Jimmy said flatly, the tufty whiskers around his mouth bouncing as he spoke. I didn't know I had an aunt, I answered. Well, it's nice to meet you, Camilla. Jimmy responded, sounded as genuine as a vegan ordering a T-bone steak. It's Carmilla. Who's Grebbles? I asked nodding at the statue and trying to change the subject. Douglas had an awkward grin on his face and I wanted to lighten the mood. Jimmy's expression finally eased as he stroked the drunken looking statue with his grubby fingertips. Ah, Grebel here is my best friend, Camilla. I winced as he got my name wrong again, but I didn't bother to correct him. He was less sour looking and I preferred to count my blessings. We've seen many an adventure together, lock-ins, invasions, the time that rabid fox tried to eat Jessica Polchester in the corner over there, and our Douglas. Douglas cut him off by slamming a shot of whiskey down in front of him and coughing. Come on, Jimmy, plenty of time to reminisce, but let's toast to the reopening of the gnome first, shall we? I wanted to know more. The rabid fox story sounded interesting. But Douglas went to a great deal of effort to stop Jimmy from talking. He placed a shot glass in front of me and one in front of him and lined up 20 more in the bar. Say something, Carmilla. Give him a little opening speech. He grinned at me. I detested public speaking with every fiber of my being and couldn't imagine a worse request. But just over Doug's shoulder was a photograph of Aunt Arlene that I had hung behind the bar. I may have never met her, but feeling like I belonged to a family for the first time in my life gave me a weird sense of responsibility. I didn't want to let her down. I panicked a little before finally grabbing a plastic jug from under the bar and banging it against the chipped mahogany worktop. The rumblings of conversation stopped and the entire room focused on me. Welcome, I shouted. It was a weak start, but I had no idea what I was doing. If you would have told me this time three months ago that I would be running a pub in the city, I would have laughed at you. To be honest, I still laugh at the idea of it now. I never knew my Aunt Arlene, but she chose me to take over this place and I want to do her proud. I hope to get to know you all over a drink and an interesting story. But for now, I want to propose a toast. To the pickled gnome, my Aunt Arlene, and a lifetime of great nights drinking. And with that, I raised my shot glass and I nodded back, feeling the burn as what I suspected was very strong vodka hit the back of my throat. The crowd clapped and cheered before knocking back the shots that Douglas had handed out as I spoke. I looked at him for approval as I started to pull pints and he gave me a reassuring nod. I seemed to have gotten off to a good start. Even Jimmy was pleasant as the evening progressed. It was a busy evening. There wasn't a bar stool free all night, and as my first night in hospitality, it was an initiation by fire, but I loved it. Customers shared stories of my aunt with me and times they had spent in the gnome. They made me feel welcome, like I was a part of the community already. About 10 o'clock, a man and his wife walked in. My new friend Jimmy informed me that their names were Phil and Sheila Moorcroft, and they lived in one of the houses opposite the pub and he said that they could be difficult occasionally. Regardless, he called them over to introduce me, and they seemed like lovely, warm, and kind people. His assessment appeared to be unfounded. Sheila was at the bar, telling me how much I reminded her of Darl and what good friends they had been. She looked emotional, and she sipped her gin and tonic and looked at the photograph behind me. When Phil slipped off to the toilet, her demeanor changed. She tearfully told me that they had been fighting that night. She suspected that he was cheating with a lady called Jessica. I felt bad that she didn't have my full attention, but her saying that reminded me that I really needed to ask Jimmy about that fox. She got more and more distressed as she told me about her situation. 
but I found it uncomfortable. Having a practical stranger spill their deepest problems to me. All the while, Jimmy sat right next to her. Grebel's in front of him, listening to the entire tale. I could see her husband making his way through the people littered across the pub back to us. I worried about Sheila's ability to hold it in. I was right to worry. Just as Phil reached the bar, Jimmy looked me dead in the eye. Buckle up, he said with a sigh. And for the first time the whole night, he left his chair and went to join a group of older men playing cards at an already packed booth. Within minutes, Sheila was screaming. People tried to pay no attention, but they couldn't help themselves. There was a live soap opera happening at the bar. She screamed about Jessica, how she apparently smelled that slut's perfume for the other day when she had got home from work, that she had seen messages between the pair. Phil ferociously denied the allegations. I asked Douglas if I should break it up, or asked them to go outside. He looked at me with a sincere expression on his face and told me, you need to back away and let them run their course. There are regulars here. Don't worry, this happens a lot. The other customers will understand. I didn't get it. The Moorcrofts seemed like a perfectly reasonable married couple. I was sure if I just spoke to them. And then a crash. I didn't get the chance to finish wondering why Douglas seemed almost frightened to get involved or why Jimmy had walked away and the other customers had all managed to inconspicuously create a two to three meter distance between themselves and the couple. Sheila answered my question as she picked up a large shard of the glass she had just smashed across her husband's face and my pub floor. Before I had a chance to react, or even to blink, she was drawing the sharp edge of the shard across her husband's throat as he desperately tried to push her away. Phil was much bigger than Sheila. He could have been able to fend her off easily, but she seemed to have gone into a superhuman rage. She clawed at the wound she created with her fingernails, still sobbing and wailing about Jessica. I stood in complete shock and horror at what I had just witnessed. Sheila's eyes were blackened with a smudged mascara, as her now dead husband bled out to my pub. My pub. My mind began to race. What on earth was I going to do? It took me a moment of panicking to realize that no one looked anywhere near as distressed as I was by the scene. Jimmy was sat at the booth with the other men, looking at the dead body on the floor, with a vague disgust in his face as he shuffled a pack of cards again casually. Douglas had made his way out there and put his hands on Sheila's shoulder to stand her up and take her away from the scene. As he walked her to a seat at the end of the bar, she passed me and looked at me with tears still in her eyes. Oh, I'm sorry about the mess, love. I didn't want to make such a bad impression on your first night. Please forgive me. I didn't think my jaw could get any lower until I turned to see a customer with Phil's hand in his, helping him up off the floor. He looked wobbly and was clutching his neck, but he stood. When he finally took his hand away, I saw that the wound itself had disappeared completely, leaving just the blood behind. No scratches or cuts on his face, not even a piece of embedded glass. Douglas continued to serve drinks as I stood at the bar catatonic. Phil joined his wife in the corner and after a quiet and inaudible discussion, they made their way out of the pub. I faintly heard Douglas making a last call in the background and continued to just stand, staring at the pool of blood all these people were delicately avoiding. The last stragglers drank up and then left. A few gave me reassuring words as they did. You did great. Dar would be so proud. You'll get used to it, don't worry. They all flew right over my head. Jimmy's friends had left, but he returned to his position next to Grebel's and remained there as Douglas locked the door. That Muppet didn't tell you anything, did he? Jimmy spat giving Doug a far more nasty look than the one I'd received when we first met. Tell me what? Why is that man not dead? It was the first that I had spoken since the incident. My words were hoarse and strained and I could see the pity in Jimmy's eyes as he looked at me. I didn't want her to run a mile, Jimmy. Daryl picked her and she's our best chance of it, not going to auction. I didn't think something like that would happen on the first night. Douglas chimed in a heavy guilt in his words. 
You think she won't run a mile now? You daft man. Jimmy retaliated. Please, can someone just tell me what's going on? I'm right here. I begged, still struggling to pick my bottom jaw up enough to speak, but bothered enough by them talking as if I wasn't in the room. Douglas looked sheepish. Jimmy sighed again, something he did a lot of, and he started to speak. This place ain't normal, Camilla. Those who drink here tend to have something a little different about them, or they don't mind those who do. The Moorcrofts are harmless, just got a bit of a need for the dramatics. Phil's not cheating, but he is an asshole when she lives a drink with trust issues. Makes for some huge blowouts. As far as warning, the Moorcrofts aren't the gnomes, only unique regulars. Not all of them will get their throat slit and get up off the floor ten minutes later. But some might try to get in your stores through gaps in the door frames, or grow sharp claws on a Thursday night that pierce all of your glasses. Best you use disposables on Thursdays. You'll thank me later. Anyway, you'll see. That is if you decide to stay. Dara was very accepting. She made us all feel welcome, no matter how unique. She must have thought that you would have been good for this place. I tried to take in what Jimmy was saying, but I couldn't. I had wondered about the sealant on the cellar door's frame, though. I presumed it was pest-proofing, but now I wasn't so sure. How could she think that when we never even met? She didn't know me, I answered, feeling emotionally overwhelmed by the whole situation. Then you didn't know her. She chose you for a reason, I promise. But if you want to leave, we get it. He scouted Douglas one more time and finished up his drink, looking resigned. The thoughts whizzed around my mind. Phil's dead body on the floor. Aunt Darlene's photo. That freaking peeling magnolia bedsit wall. Jimmy got up and made his way towards the door. I'll stay. I broke the silence in the room. Jimmy turned and smiled. Douglas looked relieved. His face had gone from pale to ready again. But you have to help me clean that up. I finished, staring at the pool of blood still very present in the middle of the floor. Douglas grabbed the mop from out back and some cleaning products from under the bar, and I started to sweep away the excess glass, the ends of my broom smearing the blood like paint. I turned to Jimmy. So, that rabid fox... My first few months at the Pickle Numb were excellent. My life had become so much more than I ever thought it would be. I had fun with my customers, enjoyed my living space in the city, and even cheeses seemed happier. In three months, I witnessed Phil die at least eight times. Jimmy told me that it was a good run and that the Moorcroft seemed happier than ever. It made me dread what could be considered as a bad run. Cheeses really took to Sheila. The cat would trot through the pub to take a space on her lap and hiss at Phil. I felt sorry for the poor man. He was never anything but nice to me. He even helped me clean his brains off the pumps when Sheila battered him to death with grebbles. Couldn't be more apologetic if he tried. I got to know all of our regulars and how to deal with some of the more unique ones. Mrs. Turner, for example, loved to drink, but God help you if you let her have more than six. Something about that seventh drink would turn her into a complete demon. She frightened the life out of poor old Michael when she bit the head off of that bird in the garden. Poor little thing didn't stand a chance. I found cheeses playing with the bottom half the next day. Me and Douglas took to using a tally chart for her. We make a mark for every drink that we serve her. It works. As the months went by, business got better and better. Eventually, I had to employ another staff member to work the bar with me and Douglas, so Natalie came along. Natalie had just turned 18 and was nervous as ever. I gave her a far more thorough induction than Douglas gave me, but I think the first time she witnessed Phil sprawled over the bar with a high heel sticking out of his neck, she was traumatized. She proved useful though. She had grown up in the area in a tower block down the street, and she knew quite a few of the guys. They all couldn't believe how big little Natalie had got, and would ask her about her grandma who had raised her. 
Natalie still lived in the block with her and spent her time working and caring. It made me sad that she never seemed to go out with friends her age, so I tried to go easy on her when I could. I knew she was a keeper when one of our older gentlemen, Mr. Prentice, took a funny turn and locked himself in the disabled toilet for three hours. When he started making disturbing, animalistic noises, I instructed Douglas to open the doors. Natalie insisted that we didn't. Mr. Prentice lived in her block, and she was very clear that it was best to not disturb him. When Mr. Prentice finally emerged, he came up to the bar with his walking stick and a small bag of shopping and apologized. He said that he usually makes it home in time when he's feeling a little off, but the gnome made him feel so comfortable that he stayed longer than he should have. He offered to pay for any cleanup and I declined. I couldn't take his money. He reminded me of the grandpa I had always wished that I had. He had such kind eyes, and honestly, how much of a mess could he make? I regretted my complacency when I inspected the damage. There was poop everywhere, up the walls, on the ceiling, and even in the sink. The most troubling part of it was the inside of the door was covered in deep, and possibly large claw marks. The frail old man who had just left couldn't possibly have done that. Who knows what might have happened if we would have opened the door. I didn't have Mr. Prentice pegged as a unique regular, but I learned that day that you don't ever know who or what you're really talking to. I just knew that for the most part, my customers were harmless. Natalie reveled in her small victory, but she was back to her jumpy self in no time when a strange visitor entered the gnome later that night. I didn't recognize him, and over the previous months I would learn that we didn't tend to get many newbies at the gnome. I welcome them of course, but the majority of my customers are repeat. I wasn't too concerned until I saw Jimmy leave his bar stool as the man approached the bar. I had come to learn that Jimmy only tended to leave his position when he felt threatened or thought that there was going to be trouble. He would wander over to the largest group and join them. I think being a part of a pack made him feel safer. Aside from home time, I had only seen him move a handful of occasions. To be honest, I don't know if Jimmy even urinated. Nothing would surprise me. The newcomer approached the chipped mahogany worktop. He wore a jacket with the hood up and had his arms pulled up into his sleeves. I watched as a thin pale hand extended out from one of them over the bar and placed a few coins in front of me. You must be the new manageress. My name is Kane. Me and Darlene had a prior agreement I was hoping to continue. Could we discuss over a large red wine, please? He spoke with a constant sense of mystery in his voice, as if he was narrating a ghost story, or was going to present me with a deal the likes of Rumpelstiltskin would wince at. He practically spat the word please, as if it had left a bad taste in his mouth. It really put me on edge. Nice to meet you, Kane. My name's Carmilla. If you could just excuse me for a moment, please. I didn't give him an option. I left his coins where they were and I went out the back leaving Natalie to man the bar whilst I went to find Douglas. Douglas was arguing with a particularly slender woman when I found him at the entrance to the stores. The lady looked at me sheepishly and ran through to the bar. One of those flat people? I asked, gesturing to the minuscule gaps around in the door. Douglas nodded and laughed. I didn't have time to ask about it. I jumped straight in. Do you know about Aunt Darlene's deal with a man called Kane? Doug's face dropped. He looked like all the blood had rushed from his cheek straight down into his feet. I was hoping he would let that go when Darl died. I should have warned you. I was just hopeful. I'm sorry, Carm. I really am. He spoke so gravely I started to panic. What do you mean? What does he want? Kane holds a meeting in the Gnome on the third Wednesday of every month for his weird friends. Darlene loved him at first. He paid on time. They always bought drinks and he was polite. Things changed when Dara found out what they were meeting about. They always demanded strict privacy, but she thought that she had heard the door go and was expecting a delivery, so she came downstairs to the back door and overheard the content of the meeting. Dara told us that Kane and his group were clogs. 
People who help others commit and cover up crime and evade punishment. They weren't aiding and embedding minor crimes though. They were the worst of the worst. Naturally, Darl confronted him, kicked the group out of the gnome, and threatened to contact the authorities. I interrupted. Just like I'm about to do too. I won't have a person like that under my roof. I started to storm back to the bar, ready to get rid of Kane, but Douglas grabbed me in protest. Stop. You didn't know your aunt, but dang it, you were stubborn like her sometimes. Kane isn't a person. He's a monster. Dar would never have let him walk free if she had a choice. I felt my heart drop into my stomach. We were surrounded by the unusual and things people would find traditionally scary. It was our normal. To hear Douglas refer to Kane as a monster truly scared me. How did he take away her choice? Douglas opened his mouth to answer, but the words never made it out. There is an eruption of shouting and commotion from the bar, followed by a shrill scream. Natalie! Douglas ran towards the door and I followed. Inside was Carnage. The first face that I confronted with was Sheila's. Mascara tears running down her face. There was no comforting dead Phil that followed her though. Instead, it was a full room of terrified punters. Carm. Natalie wheezed from her position, standing on top of the bar. Kane was sat calmly in front of her with a large glass of red wine in his hand. He had taken his head down, and I could clearly see his gleeful expression as my bartender danced for him, limbs broken, looking and contorted like a marionette. Natalie looked like she was in so much pain. The positions her body parts moved into as she danced were so unnatural. The more pain she showed, the more ecstatic Kane became. She clearly had no control over her movements, and his abilities terrified me. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, he dropped her and I watched as she collapsed. Cracking her ankle as she slipped off the bar and into the tower of glasses behind her. He turned to me and then to Douglas and smirked. I see you've been catching up on who I am. I suppose there isn't a need to explain the arrangement to you. It's a shame, really. I thought we could be civil. I'm sure Brainless here filled you in on all the information. My group will be meeting here next Wednesday at 5pm. The pub will be closed for 3 hours while we meet, and that will continue on a monthly basis. You do not want to find out what happens if that doesn't happen. I wanted to scream, to do anything I could to stop this from happening, but I could still hear Natalie whimpering on the floor, and I couldn't bring myself to risk it. I had been blindsided. Kane was walking towards the exit as he turned to me. By the way, it's nice to meet you too, Carmilla. You remind me a lot of Darlene. He said it with venom. The words slithered out. He spared one last glance at Natalie, who had barely pulled herself up to stand. He chuckled smugly and stepped outside at the same time as I heard a loud crunching sound and another scream. As the door swung, the crowds of shocked customers erupted into shouting and chaos. I ran towards Natalie, whose wrist was now bent backwards so far her knuckles were flapping against her arm. She was bruised, cut up from all the glass that she had smashed into, and was hyperventilating. I tried to calm her down and started to pick the glass out, but she was so distressed and she desperately needed medical attention. Nicole, a middle-aged woman who never drank alcohol, offered to take her to the hospital by car. Natalie gratefully agreed, and I told them to keep me updated the whole way. I offered a round in the house to all these shaken regulars, and they eventually retreated to their respective tables and chairs, leaving me, Douglas, and Jimmy, who had returned to a spot at the bar. I really hope she's okay, I voiced, totally defeated. That was nothing, Camilla. You have no idea what that creature is capable of, Jimmy ranted, not taking his eyes off of Grebel's. Douglas's face sunk. I didn't get to finish telling you the whole story. Darlene had no choice but to keep the cloaks booking. Not after Iris. I watched as a tear rolled down Douglas's cheek as he spoke. Jimmy looked equally distressed and focused so hard on that little gnome, I think he was trying to block out the world around him. Iris was another regular here. She was young, about Natalie's age, 
used to come in with her parents. Everyone liked her, and she was a nice girl who she brought her young friends in for drinks here. But they never caused a bother and it was nice to have some young blood in the place. When Daro booted Kane and his followers out, they came back three days later for revenge. Iris was unlucky. She was just stood closest to the door. I don't know how he does it, but he can make people do things with their bodies that their mind doesn't want to. I think he leaves their awareness alone on purpose, so they feel the pain and they always remember. He whispered something in Iris' ear at the entrance to the gnome, and she lost it. She walked behind the bar, grabbed a bottle of absinthe and soaked herself in it, screaming that she didn't want to. I'm sorry, it's been a while. Douglas paused to compose himself. While she was burning, Kane entered and made a speech. Told us all that if him and his people were not treated with some respect, and given their venue back, that he would annihilate each and every one of us in twisted new ways. His followers were so happy. Those crazy people were sniffing the air and smiling. Have you ever smelled a burning human, Carmilla? There's nothing more repulsive. Douglas knocked back a shot of whiskey, and I sat in disbelief, trying to find words. Why hasn't anyone done anything? Tried to hurt him or just do something? I begged. Darl tried. Jimmy piped up. She made plans every month to try and stop them. And them all while they're in one place. But Kane is always one step ahead. Nothing she did worked, it just made him angry. She gave up for the sake of everyone. She didn't want anyone else to get hurt. It infuriated me. Cowards, what about the people that they're hurting anyway? There's enough of us to overpower him, surely. Screw this, screw Aunt Darlene's agreement. This ends when they return. Jimmy shook his head at my optimism and got up to leave the bar that had slowly emptied as we spoke. He didn't say a single word. Douglas started cleaning and collecting glasses silently. They didn't fill me with much confidence, but I was determined to think of a way to take Kane down. When everything was closed and Douglas had left, I sat with cheeses and I tried to come up with a plan. Nicole texted me to tell me that Natalie was going to be fine. Just a cast for her wrist and lots of rest needed. The text came with a photo of Natalie, looking tearful but relieved. I stared at the photo. I thought of Iris, Darlene, and all the regulars that I had come to love so dearly. And then the way to win finally hit me. Last time we spoke, I told you about Kane. His group of cloaks and the deal he forced my Aunt Darlene into. It made me sick thinking of what happened to Iris and I felt even worse when Natalie returned to the pub, with her wrist in a splint looking beaten. I could not let the deal continue. Aside from how abhorred the group's philosophy, they'd frightened my regulars. Not acting on it would make me an awful landlady. My plan was solid, I hoped, but I knew that I couldn't do it alone. To take someone down with the strength that Kane had demonstrated was going to require some help. I approached my regulars for assistance over the course of the week, most of whom were terrified after the events in the pub during Kane's visit and turned me down swiftly. I had an entire community full of people who could do or become extraordinary things, but none of them were willing to risk their autonomy to help. Mrs. Turner was too frightened of the things that she may do under Kane's control. She couldn't be convinced by an offer of limitless drinks for the night, or my promises that I would do everything possible to keep her safe. After my conversation with her, I was disheartened. It was the same story with over 15 other people that I spoke to. Mr. Prentice even laughed at me. He couldn't understand what help I thought an old man like him would be. I tried to mention the incident with the toilet, but he just looked baffled as if he didn't remember it at all. There's no tactful way to ask someone if they're a monster. No wonder Aunt Darald failed to remove the cloaks. Jimmy and Douglas were in. To be honest, I didn't give them much of a choice. I threatened Jimmy with a ban from the bar and Douglas with his job. I felt terrible. Realistically, I wasn't going to follow through on either of those threats, but by this stage, I was desperate not to be alone in my endeavor. 
Natalie was a different story. Her nervous demeanor had gotten worse since her attack. I tried to insist that she took some paid time off, but she refused. She told me that she had to work to keep herself sane. She was jumpy and struggled to even collect glasses, but I wasn't about to come down on her. I hadn't even asked her for help. She offered it when she overheard me talking to Douglas about how hard a time I was having enacting my plan. I told her no a thousand times, but she was desperate to do something despite her terror. Those three were all I had, and by Tuesday, we had gotten no further in our endeavors. The plan that I thought was perfect was never going to work with that few people, and we were about to get royally screwed by Cain. So, I took two drastic measures. I told the patrons of the gnome the day I opened that I wasn't a public speaker. So for me to stand on the bar itself and beg for their help was huge. Hi everyone. As you all know, we have a customer here at the gnome that we're struggling to remove from the premises. I want to keep you all safe, but I can't do that without your help. And if you want to all continue drinking here, then I suggest that you get involved. I thought I made a great speech, but I'd never seen a pub clear as quickly as that. These people were scared. My plea for help acted like a last call. The majority drank up and got up. It was only early in the evening, so I knew it signified a lack of faith in me, but a few remained. Phil and Sheila didn't disappoint me, and I was grateful to see them still sitting there. Their talents were going to be particularly useful. I don't think there's much he can do to me, not that my wife hasn't already. Phil Joe to break the silence, making a through cutting motion with his finger and twitching his head in his wife's direction. Jimmy laughed and Sheila gave him daggers, but with cheeses firmly anchored on her lap, and I didn't think Sheila wanted to disturb her by getting up. Another lady sat across the bar next to Natalie. I knew her name was Tiffany, but we hadn't interacted a lot. Thanks for being here. I said handing her a vodka lemonade, her usual drink, and the only other thing that I knew about her. I wouldn't miss it. She started, tears in her eyes. Iris was my best friend. What that monster did to her. Her voice broke as she tried to find the words and the only other customer to remain threw his arm around her shoulders. Quentin was a daily visitor of the gnome. He never stayed for long and he would pop in on his route home from his job as a road sweeper. He was always dressed in his high visibility gear, and this occasion was no different. Tiffany was a very glamorous young girl, but despite Quentin's grubby work gear, she looked grateful for the comfort. He tried to change the subject. I stayed because those people always made it so I couldn't get a drink on a Wednesday. Ruined the whole day. Screw those guys. I think that was the most that I'd ever heard him speak. I didn't know if Quentin or Tiffany were standard regulars or not, and I didn't want to pry. I just really hoped that they could hold their own. We strategized over drinks for hours, and after many a useless suggestion, mostly from Douglas, they finally settled on a course of action. I was going to be in the apartment upstairs alone when they entered, to make them feel as if they had won and then Phil would enter as our bait a while into their meeting. He was going to try and incest the whole group to bring their focus onto him. He intended to look like a rogue, protesting alone. Sheila was insistent that after he had their attention, she would go in. Nothing makes me angry as Phil, except for people hurting Phil, she said, convinced that their reaction to him would cause her superhuman rage to kick in. I pointed out the issues. That Kane could take control of her, use her rage against the rest of us, which is where Tiffany came in. She had been quiet throughout the conversation and she winced every time Kane was mentioned, but after hearing Sheila's intentions, she finally piped up. No, I go in after Phil, she said gravely. Why would you do that? Sheila spat at her across the bar. I could see the insane jealousy bubbling inside her. Luckily, Douglas had spotted that too. Not the time, Sheila. He shouted at her from his seat. She did back down and let Tiffany speak. I have the best chance of resisting him, 
She said flatly. After a moment of silence, she could sense the confusion on our faces and continued. He's not the only person who can do things. Watch. Tiffany took a step back from the rest of us and stood with her arms either side of her, palms facing us. She closed her eyes and in less than a blink had vanished entirely. What the heck? I heard come from Jimmy, someone who was really shocked. He can't control me if he can't see me. Came Tiffany's voice from thin air. I can come in behind Bill. While Kenny's using him like some plaything, and I can find the right position to kill him. I felt something hit the back of my neck and I turned around to see Tiffany, standing behind me, meters away from where she had vanished. Her words made me uncomfortable. I'm not so sure about the killing. I started, but Quentin interrupted me. You have no idea how many people they've killed, and how many that have survived wish they had been killed. If anybody deserves it, it's them. Iris didn't want to die. We were going to go to Amsterdam that year. Tiffany added from behind me. Natalie looked at me from across the room. Since the incident, she had had a look of despair in her eyes that I couldn't get out of my mind. She just looked so broken and those eyes were boring into my soul. The idea of killing made me uncomfortable, but I doubted I was uncomfortable as Natalie strung up like a marionette puppet on the bar. I knew they were right. There was no way to do this without a death. Not counting Phil, of course. I thought of all their victims, too, and how much I wanted to help them. We finalized details and planned for Phil to enter the pub 15 minutes into the meeting to kick things off. The rest of them would arrive in the garden out back as Phil entered. We had one last drink together, and they started to venture home leaving just me and Douglas to clean up. Natalie walked home with Tiffany, so that she wouldn't have to be on her own. Carm, you know Darl tried, right? Doug mused as he swept the seating area. She walked with a stick for the last two years of her life after Kane broke her leg when she called the police. He talked his way out of everything, all the evidence that she had gathered. It broke her, Carm. I don't want to see the same thing happen to you. I thought of my aunt. I never knew that she walked with a stick. But then, I never knew her. There was so much about her that I had to learn. It won't, Doug. I've got all of you. Kane and his creepy friends don't stand a chance. You saw Tiffany. We won't fail. We can't. I put on a brave face. I was trying to convince myself as much as Douglas. I just hope you're right. We finished up about an hour or so later and Douglas went home, leaving me to lay in bed, mind racing, with cheeses on my lap. I tried to organize my thoughts, but they just meshed into a deafening white noise. I was amazed that I heard the phone buzz at all. There was a video attachment from an unknown number. I opened it up and it was taken a few minutes down the road from the gnome. Outside the tower block that Natalie, Mr. Prentent, and a number of my regulars lived in. I watched Natalie arrive outside and give Tiffany a massive hug, look around and then enter the building. And then it cut to a different shot of Natalie, this time much closer. It was taken from above her while she slept in bed. A thin pale hand reached out and moved a stray hair away from her face so gently, I wasn't sure that he even touched it. The person then turned and calmly walked out of the room before the footage cut out. My stomach did backflips. As the video finished, I noticed a text message that had followed it. It made me want to throw up. I can get her anytime I want. Don't try anything. See you tomorrow. My heart raced after receiving the video from Kane. I didn't bother to text him back or give me satisfaction. Instead, I called Natalie. Are you okay? I asked frantically. I had clearly woken her up and she sounded groggy. She didn't know what I was talking about. Kane was gone. It had just been a way to scare us into submission. I told Natalie what had happened. I didn't want to. I knew what it would do to her. But she deserved to know the danger that she was in. Carm, what am I supposed to do? 
I've got my grandmother here. She can't be hurt. What if he comes in? It was so painful last time. I could hear her starting to hyperventilate over the phone. I had to stop her. Is there anyone that you can stay with? Just until tomorrow and then you can come straight here. He wants me, not you. I'm so sorry, Nat. I tried to think of viable solutions. More than a few of our more special regulars lived in that block. And I know none of them would want anything to happen to her. I'll be okay for the night, Carm. I'm gonna barricade my front door. Deadbolt it and everything. At least then, I would hear him come in. If he was going to hurt me, he would have done it by then. I could tell that she was trying to convince herself, and she wasn't doing a great job of convincing me that she was fine. I didn't get a minute's sleep that night. Instead, I counted the stains on my bedroom ceiling multiple times. 37. I was feeling pretty disheveled and tired by the time that I heard a knock at the door. I almost jumped out of my skin. It was Natalie. She was alive. Thank God. I gave her a massive hug and she smiled weakly. Is the kettle on? Just going down the stairs in the block felt like a marathon today. She huffed, hands on her thighs. I got the tea going and I sat together in the bar. It had better seating than upstairs. Have you worked out what you're going to do now? What's the new plan? Natalie asked. I sighed. Staring at my ceiling, counting stains hadn't given me any inspiration. I had nothing. The plan remains the same. I still think that we can blindside them with Phil. Don't worry, I've got this under control. That was a lie. You're underestimating Kane and you know it. I didn't have time to respond. Just to tut and shake my head. Douglas was at the door. He had bought pastries for breakfast. You look awful, Carm. It wasn't the friendliest greeting I'd ever had, but I couldn't argue with him. Natalie shot me daggers as she ate her cinnamon swirl. Cheeses napped on Douglas's lap, and just looking at her made my eyes feel heavy. I had no idea how I was going to stay away to face Kane, let alone remove him. The day passed and the clock ticked. We didn't open the pub that day. We just waited, knowing that it could very well be the end of life at the Pickle Gnome as we knew it. Natalie's cold glare softened when we heard them enter downstairs. She went from a hardened presence that was judging me to a little girl that I'd have protected minutes. We just have to stay here, I said, trying to keep my composure. I wondered how long it would take for Phil to arrive. I could already hear tables and chairs being moved around below me. Crap, I wasn't cut out for a leadership role here. It didn't take long. I heard the most gut-wrenching crunch followed by shouting. Carmilla, I suggest you get down the stairs now. I froze for a moment at the sound of his voice. Had Tiffany entered yet? What about Sheila? Were my regulars all dead on the floor downstairs? How did they kill Phil this time? The girl and that blundering idiot too. Hurry up. Kane sounded impatient this time. Natalie grabbed a hold of my arm, digging her nails in so hard I'm sure I bled, but the poor girl was so scared I couldn't stop her. Douglas led the way. The scene was awful. Kane's friends had literally torn Phil apart. They slashed his limbs with broken glass and severed an entire arm. I gasped at the sight, and the closest goon to the body booted him so hard in the face that his features collapsed inwards. I tried to warn you, Carmilla. Why have you done this to yourself? Your friends? Kane smirked at me and raised an eyebrow. He enjoyed the game. I surveyed the room. It was hard to take my eyes off of Phil's grotesque corpse on the ground. I wasn't sure he could reattach his arm. Sheila hadn't dismembered him before. I couldn't see anyone else, but I knew that it didn't mean Tiffany wasn't there. Please, don't hurt anyone. I didn't know he was going to do this. I got the message, I promise. I plead. 
feigning ignorance and sticking to the original plan. Sleep deprivation was getting to me, and I was struggling to speak properly. I don't think you did. I hold the manager rest responsible for any issues my group has during our book time here, so I'm afraid your weak begging won't cut it. He looked me dead in the eyes and I felt Natalie's nails dig further into my skin. She wailed and convulsed before collapsing in agony, arms suspended in midair holding her up as if she were tied to something. Stop it you monster! Douglas screamed, making me jump. Please don't hurt her. Hurt me. It's me that deserves this, not her. I added, running down the stairs towards Kane. I wouldn't come any closer, he said calmly, holding his palm out towards me. I stopped. He scrunched his hand into a fist and I heard a wailing from behind me. I turned to see Natalie being hoisted off the floor by her own arms. Her feet dangled desperately until even her tiptoes couldn't reach the floor. I heard her arm click out of place as it struggled to hold her weight, watched as her joints dislocated under the strain. I had never seen pain like that. I turned back to Kane. You're evil, was all I could manage. I was in pure shock and had no words. And you're stupid. Hurting you wouldn't be half the fun as. He was cut off. Literally, in fact by a large knife that sliced into his throat. In the blink of an eye, Tiffany was visible behind him, hacking at his neck like she was possessed. Natalie hit the floor with a thud, panting with relief. Iris was beautiful. She was the most amazing person, and you took her. Tiffany cried as she sawed through vertebrae with an incredible strength. The room instantly descended into chaos. I realized that the part of the plan I hadn't thought through was the bit where we would be hugely outnumbered by Kane's sociopath friends. There were more than I thought, around ten of them. Douglas had already been grabbed. He was being beaten viciously to the ground by two of them. I tried to run to him, but caught Natalie being manhandled by a large, vile-looking man, and I changed course. I knew Doug would understand. When I was eventually grabbed myself, I realized that we were hopeless. It was likely that we were all going to die in the gnome. The man's fingers dug into my collarbones as he dragged me across the room. Another grabbed a bar stool and began to lift it. I was certain that he was going to use it to end my life. But then the door opened. The crack of dusty light was like a ray of hope that was soon blocked by Sheila's incredibly angry silhouette. She screamed when she saw him, Phil, on the floor with his face all squashed in like that. It wasn't like the multiple times that she had killed him. It was real devastation. She let out a guttural, primal cry that hurt my soul. It stopped every inch of chaos in its tracks. No one could take their eyes off of her. The man holding me even loosened his grip. She stopped for only a moment, before unleashing her overwhelming anger on the room. Sheila was a small woman, about 5'4 in heels, but she could attack more violently than any man I had ever seen. She was the true human incarnation of rage. She ripped through the room, blood spraying in her path. Quentin had come in behind her and was battering the attackers with a broom, a satisfied look on his face. They would have eaten him alive if he hadn't been with Sheila. The bodies began to pile up. It wasn't long before she had reached me and ripped the face off the man who had been holding me. Flaps of his cheeks littered the floor. Sheila finally made it to Tiffany, who wasn't moving on the floor after a violent beating by two of Kane's goons, next to their decapitated leader. She reached out towards Juan and dug her thumbs into the eye sockets. Individually, they started to bleed. You expect eyeballs to come out easy, but they don't. There's a lot of mess first. As she turned to attack the last remaining follower, he reached into his pockets and he pulled out a gun. It stopped Sheila in her tracks. I felt woozy. No amount of rage was going to make Sheila bulletproof, and no amount of strange antics in this pub could have prepared me for the slaughter. Stop, please, just go. No one else needs to get hurt. I screamed. Oh, now you want to be peaceful because I have a gun, right? Well, that isn't going to work. All my friends are dead. You're coming with us, you. 
and then a thud. He hit the floor. Have you ever seen an old friend and felt warm inside? Like everything in the world was okay. Well, that's how I felt when I saw Grebbles coming towards the gunman's head with quite the velocity. I had wondered where Jimmy had been all this time. I don't know how long he had been under the bar for, but I had never felt more warm inside. He chastised me for even attempting to stop Kane, but in the end, he was there for us. Sheila grabbed a hold of the gun from next to the unconscious man and shot him three times. She didn't stop to stare. She dropped it instantly and ran to Phil's mangled corpse and sobbed. I surveyed the pub. The bodies everywhere and my friends. Trying to pick up the pieces. Douglas was comforting Natalie while she cried into his arms. Jimmy stood with Sheila, desperately trying to wake Phil. It may sound sick, but he had never looked more dead before. In the corner was Quentin, stood over Tiffany. I ran to them. I wanted to try and help, to get her up so we could get her to the hospital, but as soon as I saw her, I knew. It was too late. She was gone. I looked at Quentin and I pulled him close for a hug. As tears streamed on my face, I could see the front outline of someone standing up. It was Phil. His features were no longer sunken in and disfigured, but he looked far more disheveled than usual, and he was noticeably still missing an arm. You're alive, Sheila screamed. Of course I am, honey. You've tried harder than they did before. He chuckled awkwardly. I'm not sure I'll get that appendage back, though. He pointed to his severed arm with the one that remained. He tugged at the sleeve of his shirt to reveal a perfectly healed stump. I smiled a little. Amongst the chaos, there was some normality, but my moment of peace was bittersweet. I was instantly reminded of Tiffany. There was nothing any of us could do. We tried CPR and everything, but she had stopped breathing. There was no heartbeat. Her parents knew about her special talents. They were there when Iris. They deserved to know the truth. Quinton suggested after a long bout of silence amongst the group. He tried to be strong, but his voice cracked as he fought tears. We'll come with you. Let's take her home. Sheila answered him softly, putting an arm around his shoulder. She had gone from killing machine to someone who was gentle and maternal. We all helped wrap Tiffany in bedsheets. I made sure they were clean ones. It felt more respectful. And then we loaded her into the back of Quentin's council van. He only ever had one pint at the end of work, so he often parked the van outside. When they drove away, there was a void. Everyone left in the pub could feel the pangs of loss. Natalie was late in the booth recovering. The damage to her arms wasn't as bad as I had initially thought. Tiffany had stopped Kane in time. The endurance of the human body is amazing, and Natalie was one tough cookie. Douglas was cleaning. It's what he did after anything he found stressful. Jimmy stopped him. There's no point mopping up, Doug. We need to get rid of the bodies. Crap. Another thing that I hadn't thought of. I know how. Came a feeble voice. Natalie hoisted herself up. But you need to cut them up first. Jimmy didn't question her. Come on, Doug. As the lady says. He grabbed Douglas by the arm and they started moving the bodies into the cellar. Once they were all gone, I grabbed the mop that Douglas had gotten out and I started to clean the gnome. I wasn't about to let all that sacrifice be for nothing. We were going to open the next day and have drinks for Tiffany. I focused so hard on removing every drop of blood that my vision started to blur. Carm, you need to sleep. Natalie commanded from her booth. No, Nat, I can't. This is all my fault. I have to do something. I answered, scrubbing at Grebbles who Jimmy had left safely on the bar. Tiffany knew the risk. We all did. You should be proud. You had the balls to stop them. Think about all the people that you saved tonight. All those victims. I had tried to take in her words, but I couldn't. My mind had shut down. I carried on cleaning. Eventually, Jimmy and Douglas surfaced. About 11 p.m., Natalie weakly stood up. She insisted that she needed to get the dismembered parts home. 
She said that she could dispose of them in her block once it reached 1.11 a.m. This raised a huge amount of questions that I wasn't sure I wanted to know the answers to, so I decided not to ask. Douglas loaded up his car and helped Natalie into the passenger seat. The gnome was clean, the bodies were gone, but it still felt like a different place, like Kane had ripped the soul from it. Jimmy checked if I was going to be okay and he made his way home. I locked the doors and I made my way upstairs where I laid in a bed and cuddled up with cheeses. My mind raced but eventually, sleep deprivation got the better of me and I crashed. I woke up the next morning unsure of how I felt. I realized my idea to hold drinks for Tiffany may have been a bit soon, but I was determined to get the place up and running. Douglas arrived and made tea around noon. It was refreshing to see him. I asked if he had heard from Natalie, and he said that he had spoken to her that morning, and everything had gone smoothly. I considered asking about her methods again, but decided it was better I never knew. We prepped the bar, and things started to feel almost normal. Opening the doors was a release. Jimmy was in position within minutes, and Phil and Sheila were at a table telling some other regulars about Phil's lack of an arm. Maybe the gnome was going to be okay. I was feeling hopeful. Camilla. Jimmy stopped me between pouring pints. He still never got my name right. Larger? I asked, almost smiling. No, well, yes. But I need to tell you something. My heart sunk. What? When we moved the bodies, I shushed him. Don't talk so loudly, I begged. Jimmy looked around. And then he said something that sent chills up my spine. It's Kane. We never found his head.